Good morning, everybody. My name is Epiphany and I'm a trustee of Butterfly Conservation. It is my great pleasure to welcome you to our first Scottish gathering of 2021. When we met last in autumn, I think many of us hoped that we'd be back at Battleby today, catching up with our friends over coffee and browsing the stalls there. Nevertheless, I'm so glad uh, that technology means we can still meet up today and share the experience of some great talks. So wherever you're zooming in from today, I thoroughly hope that you enjoy the next three hours. We have some excellent guest speakers and some familiar faces as well. And I've heard there might be a moth or two uh, making an appearance as well. It goes without saying that the past 12 months have been really difficult for everybody. And yet I'm so proud of the things that we have achieved as an organization. We have pulled through a pandemic and economic turmoil, and we haven't just scraped through it, we have actually thrived. Despite COVID, there have been huge successes, and especially for us here in Scotland. Congratulations to the Scottish team and all involved in the successful funding bid for Species on the Edge. This is a huge collaborative project between Nature Scott and seven different organisations. The aim is to improve the fortunes of 40 of our priority species found along Scotland's coastlines and islands, which are quite literally living on the edge. Butterfly Conservation are delighted to have our very own David Hill working on this project to conserve species like the Northern Brown Argus, Small Blue and Slender Scotch Burnet. The great thing about this project is that because it involves Scotland's coastlines, there should be something going on in every branch for you all to get involved with. And I think we'll be hearing more about that later. Um, there should be some upcoming volunteer opportunities for you. We're also very pleased to hold on to another wonderful uh, staff member as Polly Philpott has moved from our Munching Caterpillar project to our much loved Bog Squad. If you haven't heard about this before, Bog Squad works to restore our precious peatlands in the central belt by blocking drains and removing invasive species. We also do a lot of recording of bog specialist species like the large heath butterfly. This work can only continue due to the generous support of Nature Scott, who have just confirmed approval of our funding bid for 2021. This money also helps to support import important work on threatened species by Tom Prescott and our brilliant volunteer engagement programme run by Anthony McCluskey. So on behalf of us all at BC Scotland, thank you to Nature Scott for their continued support. Thinking on a local level now, I know that many of you have remained as dedicated recorders as ever. And although we haven't always been able to travel as far as we liked, it hasn't stopped the records from coming in. I'm not sure about the other two branches, but here in East Branch, we've already had a brand new purple hair streak site discovered and plans for this year's Northern Brown Argus surveys are well underway. So my last thank you goes out to you, our members, for sticking with us and remaining as enthusiastic as ever. I'm looking forward to hopefully getting back out in the field with some of you this summer. Before I introduce our first speaker, I have a few things that I've been told I have to tell you about. The first is that as this is a webinar, we speakers cannot see or hear you, but we do love hearing your questions, so please ask away using the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. We kindly ask that you don't put questions in the chat um, as it makes it difficult for me to find them, but please do feel free to use this function. We will also be recording this webinar for those who couldn't make it this morning. If you're on Twitter, please do share your thoughts on photos with the hashtag BC Spring Gathering. I'll type that in the chat when I'm finished as well to remind you. And finally, we'll be taking a break at 10 past 11 so you can have a break from the screen and get some coffee. Now, I've tried to keep my intro short today because I'm anticipating a lot of questions for our keynote speaker, Peter Eels. The last time I saw Pete, we were in the Norfolk Broads trying and mostly failing to spot swallowtails. At that point, Pete only had one photo left to obtain for his amazing life cycles of UK butterflies, which I'm sure is now a feature on many of our bookcases. So I'm very much looking forward to hearing about it with a bit of a Scottish slant. So thank you for joining us and over to you, Pete. Great, thanks Epiphany. So let me just share my screen. 
So we were somewhat successful because we did find eggs and caterpillars. So we didn't do too badly. So hopefully everyone can see see this. Um, yeah, so the slant, as Epiphany said, is um, to re really look at life cycles of British and Irish butterflies, but specifically Scotland's butterflies. Um, so what I'm going to do is really tell a story of why, why I think an interest in life cycles is really important from a recording perspective and can potentially open up uh, new opportunities uh, for us recorders. Um, one of the things I wanted to do, though, was just start with, well, um, I think I tweeted on this, was, was really to convey the message that the Scottish butterfly fauna is actually quite, uh, quite unique in its, in its own right. Um, now, obviously, um, so I'm, what I'm going to do is look at the different families. Um, but again, the key message here is that there's a huge amount of diversity, even within the 36 species, which are recognised as resident or regular um, migrants into Scotland. Um, probably one of the most well-known, especially for those of us that live in southern England, such as myself, is the Chequered Skipper. So many of us make pilgrimage, pilgrimages to Scotland specifically to see uh, that butterfly each year. Um, but we have other skippers as well. So here you can see the dingy skipper and a pair of large skippers with the, the male sat behind the female there. Um, so al already some uh, relatively unique uh, fauna showing up there. Uh, in terms of the whites, it may look at uh, face value. I'm not sure if you can, let me just see if I can move my bar. I'm hoping you can see uh, the majority of my screen, even if I can't, because I can see all the other panelists. Um, but looking at some of the other families, you know, it may seem at face value that, um, yeah, okay, we see these species pretty much everywhere, but there are some interesting subspecies. So if, like me, you're a bit of a butterfly obsessive, then you may get into considering subspecies at a certain point in time. Uh, and one of those subspecies is the Thompsoni subspecies of green veined white, which has very, very dark um, markings on its underside uh, and dark markings generally. So, um, so this is one of the species that if you see in Scotland is more likely to be uh, of the Thompsoni uh, subspecies. So again, even the whites, something as common as a green veined white can be fairly interesting. Uh, moving on, and then we, as we move into the nymphalidae, uh, which is the group of uh, the taxonomists are always regrouping things, but currently in the nymphalidae of the browns, which uh, were once known as the satyridae, a separate family, and now the subfamily of the nymphalidae uh, called satyrini. Um, and looking at the list, you can see, well, actually, quite a few of them are fairly unique subspecies that are only found in Scotland. I mean, some good examples. Examples of the Scotica subspecies of large heath, large heath, which has much reduced spotting. Uh, the mountain ringlet, which is um, uh, has a different makeup actually to those found in Cumbria, uh, which is the Nemon subspecies. Um, and Melissa um, Minter did an excellent uh, talk not so long ago on the dis differences between the subspecies found in Europe. So I recommend you look that up if, if you can. Um, the one subspecies I haven't seen is the Rumensis subspecies of small heath, which is only found on the Isle of Rum, but it's on my bucket list uh, to go and actually find that critter at, at some point. And even things like meadow browns and graylings have unique subspecies which are only found in Scotland. Uh, so, for example, uh, if I just take the grayling as an example, well, actually, the, the grayling scota subspecies I uh, encountered at St. Ab's Head and the splendida subspecies of meadow brown and the Atlantica subspecies of grayling I came across at Arden American Point uh, next to the lighthouse there on the, on the rocks and the uh, surrounding area. So um, the other thing I find that is that this interest in finding all of our subspecies does take you to some incredibly beautiful places uh, and Scotland is like a second home to me now um, because of that actually wonderful part of the world. Um, the different colour that I've highlighted on this uh, particular slide is to recognise that there were some subspecies that are no, for, no longer formally recognised in the uh, uh, checklist, so the David Agassiz checklist, um, and they are the Insularum subspecies of small billboarded fritillary and the Scotica subspecies of dark green fritillary and the Scotica subspecies of marsh fritillary. Personally, uh, I think the small purple fritillary is a good subspecies. And the reason I think it's good is that if you look at its larvae, the final instar larva is actually a different colour to those found uh, in southern England, for example. Uh, and it's something I do need to write up. But uh, uh, more, more will come in the future, I'm sure, regarding that subspecies. And the other thing I wanted to highlight was the comma. 
Um, when Paul Kirkland sent me his list of, you know, these are the 36 species found in Scotland, I thought, comma? Oh, yeah, it is there, isn't it? Because when I was a boy, it was only found in Gloucestershire, where I lived in uh, Herefordshire. So to see it expand its range, no doubt due to uh, climate change, is just fantastic. Uh, so good to see that. But hopefully you're getting the impression that, the, you know, uh, you know, Scottish butterflies are a really diverse set in and of their own right. And another one that's recently turned up and, you know, my hat's off to uh, Ian Cow and others that have done the, the groundwork, the field work to relocate White Letter Hair Street just to, over the border. Um, again, it's, you know, a really, really amazing uh, find. And then, of course, we have a couple of other subspecies. So the Northern Brown Argus, uh, the uh, nominate subspecies from which the um, uh, the species gets its specific name uh, is the one found in Scotland with the white dots, which apparently is more closely related to those found in Scandinavia than those found in England, the Salmasis subspecies, which uh, again is quite interesting. Um, and one of the things that we're constantly finding is that with DNA analyses that um, some of our understanding of butterflies and uh, ta especially taxonomy is changing um, and being clarified as a result. So, so it's all good. And the final one I've put in here is the Mariscalore subspecies of common blue. So Mariscalore is, you know, colour of the sea. Um, the particular um, feature that you often see are the females are shown here in the bottom right, which have really, really large and beautiful um, orange lunules around the edges of the wings. Now, now, this particular photo was taken in Northern Ireland, but um, it's thought that this particular subspe subspecies is also found in southwest Scotland as well, although I've not personally come across it there. So, But in summary, uh, you know, a really diverse set of um, species, but also subspecies as well. Uh, lots to interest us um, uh, enthusiasts. So, um, so let's talk about life cycles. So, um, so this is a statement made in jest to some extent, but just think how much fun you could be having. <laughs> So if you think about, okay, so you've got the 36 species, well, if you start to consider all of its stages, then you are talking about 144 subjects of interest. And you can go further because if you're an obsessive like me, if you actually look at all of the larval instars, so every caterpillar goes through a number of skin changes and each uh, skin, if you like, is, an in, is known as an instar, if you add all of them together and assume that on average there are five instars per species, which is roughly about right, you end up with 288 subjects of interest. Um, and I like a challenge, as I always say. Uh, so you can see the checkered skipper on the right. But, um, you know, this is uh, a, a further dimension to the interest that you can have in our butterfly fauna. But um, I always ask myself, well, why? What, what would be the point of actually trying to observe all of these different um, subjects, especially all of the uh, immature stages, even further than that, all of the larval instars? So we have some good examples uh, when we think about, you know, some of the species we do record. Now, even though the brown hair streak isn't found in Scotland, um, it's quite well known that one of the ways of locating um, and, and monitoring the distribution of the species is to look for its eggs, which are laid, you know, they're very uh, visible white eggs laid on dark black thorn bark uh, in predictable locations, which is normally in the fork of a, of a branch and a, and a twig. Um, so that's a well-known technique for looking at the distribution of the brown hair streak, so much so that um, the butterfly is now being recorded in some areas where the adults have never been seen, only the eggs. So uh, a good example there of uh, immature stages being used as the basis of recording. And again, even though we're not a species found in Scotland, the silver spotted skipper is another uh, species that you can monitor by looking at its eggs, looking for its eggs. So um, every year, Dan Hall does a continuous transect. Um, so Dan is a director of conservation, of butterfly conservation, but um, he laboriously goes, I, I believe, with support from Martin Warren as well, which many of us, who many of us know, um, take, you know, basically work a hillside along a single route and, um, uh, you know, spend a huge amount of time looking for eggs, which are normally laid in quite predictable places, which is normally in a, uh, a fairly warm area above bare ground. Um, but they're quite easy to find on tufts of sheep's fescue. Um, with climate change, the butterfly is starting to lay in 
uh, areas that may have been considered too cool once. So not necessarily only over Bear Grant now as well. So again, we can start to see changes in uh, the ecology of the butterfly as a result of this kind of monitoring. Um, and then the third way of uh, you know, using um, immature stages for the basis of monitoring and recording are uh, those species which have um, larval webs, which would include the glanville fritillary on the Isle of Wight, but also the marsh fritillary, which is found in Scotland. Uh, these photos are actually taken from a place called North Bull Island, which is just off the east coast of Dublin. Uh, it's actually a man-made structure. So when Dublin Harbour was dug out, um, they deposited the silt and what have you uh, into uh, what became North Bull Island, Island. So it became overgrown and it has an amazing amount of devil's bit scabious. So there's probably a couple of football pitches worth of devil's bit scabious on the island. And um, because, of, because the marsh fritillary lays its eggs in fairly large batches, when the larvae emerge, they start to create these webs, which you can find um, at the start of the year. Uh, uh, sorry, at the end, end of the year, so in August, for example, and then in the following spring, so in February, as you can see in the bottom right here, um, the larvae starts to form smaller groups, but really, really visible groups as they, you know, their black bodies are used to absorb heat as they bask collectively uh, in, in the sun. Um, and if you actually stand on a slightly raised um, area at North Bull Island, you can look around. I, th I think at one point I counted something like 80 larval webs or well, sorry, 80 of these groups, because uh, they were just so visible um, against the, uh, the pale uh, dead grass that they were basking on. Um, in February, on that same date, actually, there was also an area that was completely flooded. And it was, I was astonished to find, because I thought all of the larvae in this area, in this flooded area, would have met their demise. But what they'd actually done is form these little groups and silk up a, you know, a series of grass blades to hold themselves above the water. So, um, so again, an absolutely fascinating uh, thing to see and good to see that there weren't too many casualties among, uh, among that. And I must admit, I did save a few uh, by moving them. Uh, they didn't uh, seem to be in such a good, good position. Um, but the thing that really clinched the value of um, studying the immature stages was actually a single paper, which is the one referred to at the bottom here by Hans van Dijk and colleagues. And this is looking at the wall butterfly. Um, so the thing to remember is that the wall can only successfully overwinter as a third instar caterpillar. And in the north of its range, it goes through two full broods. Um, the butterflies, you know, lay eggs, the caterpillars get to the third instar and they successfully overwinter. In the south of its range, the butterfly can go through three full broods. And again, the ca uh, caterpillar can get to the third instar and successfully overwinter. But in the middle, between these two areas, roughly speaking, we end up with a proportion of the population that tries to put in a third brood, but is unable to actually get to the third instar caterpillar. So maybe it goes beyond the third instar, uh, fourth instar, fifth instar, butterflies emerge and they can't find each other and don't mate, or egg, eggs are laid, but are, uh, and they, you know, don't hatch and they fail because of the uh, conditions or caterpillars just don't get to the third instar. And this is what's called the, in the paper, a developmental trap. And it's one of the theories for why the wall brown is declining is that in certain areas, it's trying to put in a third brood and then failing. And then of course, the result is a smaller population the following, uh, the following year. Um, now the reason, you know, whether you agree on in this hypothesis or not is not really the point. The point to me was, um, how do I identify a third in star wall caterpillar? Because that seemed to me to be something that wasn't really that well documented. So um, that really provided me some inspiration for thinking about pulling together all of the different uh, facets of immature stages and, and uh, begging, stealing and borrowing from other photographers and other enthusiasts to say, you know, collectively, if we were to bring all of this information together and use all of the resources available to us, uh, could we produce something that would actually make a difference when it comes to conserving our butterflies? Uh, and ultimately, um, a book was born out of this. Um, but if I sort of take a step back in time to say, well, where did all of this start? Well, actually, one of my personal heroes is Frederick William Frohawk, who produced this two-volume masterpiece uh, published in 1924. Um, and, uh, you know, those volumes are one of my probably most 
treasured, treasured possessions. Um, and I've got them just down there. I should have held them back. They're actually quite large um, volumes and the plates in them are absolutely beautiful. Um, now, one of the problems with using um, Frohawk is that if you look at the um, some of the immature stages, um, they're all drawn life size. So if you look at a first instar caterpillar, it just looks like a bit of a brown blob. Uh, it's very hard to, you know, if you did have a magnifying glass on this thing, you wouldn't have a clue what you were looking at if you actually found anything. Um, to compensate for that, Frohawk has quite extensive descriptions. Um, so, for example, if I take the first paragraph, uh, both of behavior and appearance. So the larva makes its exit by eating all around the clown, crown, or nearly so, clown, <laughs> rather low down. It then pushes up the lid and crawls out. OK, so there's some behavior being described. The rest of what of the text shown on this screen is actually um, describing that first instar larva. So um, I thought, well, given the modern photographic equipment, we can do better. So this description was with, with regard to the Scotch Argus. So the caterpillar crawling out and its appearance. So if you imagine what we can do today, um, so this is a Scotch Argus caterpillar, and it, this is a photo of it leaving, you know, moving out of its egg. And you can see uh, what it looks like when it first emerges from the egg. So um, I thought, well, if we can actually do, you know, get these kinds of images, maybe, maybe, hopefully, we can replicate Frohawk. And uh, I do like to think he would have approved, but we'll never know. <laughs> um, now, of course, there were always going to be some really challenging species. And one of those for me, because uh, I live in the south of England, was the checkered skipper, because at the time, there was no plans for reintroduction. And the only place to see them was in northwest Scotland. So Glasrim Wood was one of my favourite haunts. Um, I concocted an excuse to work at, um, uh, so I work in IT, but to spend a large proportion of the next few years working in Glasgow. Um, the hidden plan, of course, was to spend as much time as possible looking at checkered skippers. <laughs> um, and Glasrim Wood, uh, an amazing place. Um, it's on the banks of Loch Creran, below Benchelaine. Um, and most people who've been there will be familiar with the car park. This is a view of the, uh, of the car park from the other side of the lock, actually. So you probably haven't seen it from that side. And it's a very well-known uh, checkered skipper site. It's also the one that's uh, most well-known and closest to Glasgow. So there was also a motivation there to, uh, uh, to use that as a study site. Uh, so well recognised that there's a signpost there with a checkered skipper on it. So as you walk into the reserve, you'll, you'll see that post and you know you're heading in the right direction. Um, <coughs> excuse me. So, um, so the reason this is a good site for the checkered skipper um, to some degree is that there's a way leave um, which is cleared periodically uh, to um, make sure that the power lines that run through it aren't uh, obstructed by, um, you know, uh, any uh, any growth it could be you know birches growing up and what have you um which makes it the perfect habitat for checkered skipper because it very it's very sheltered it's very warm um and it has all the ingredients for um checkered this checkered skipper uh in terms of its ecology uh so the checkered skipper feeds so the lava feeds on purple moor grass um I'll, I'll talk a little bit more more about that but essentially this is a, a wonderful site um it also has more than its fair share of midges. Uh, I've got to thank Neil Freeman, who I bumped into at Glen Loy and said, uh, it's a bit weird because these you know, two men from the south of England suddenly bump into each other in Northwest Scotland and knew each other. Uh, but he recommended Avon Skin So Soft, which is apparently used by the Royal Marine Commandos. So hard as nails and really soft skin, I guess. But uh, that always makes me chuckle. I'm sure these aren't the legs of a Marine, but... Uh, uh, I can recommend this for midges. Apparently, it's not so good with the mosquitoes. Um, so, um, I spent some time at Glasdrum Wood, and on the 27th of May, 2014, I was taking a photo of a small pool bordered fritillary, and a checkered skipper flew in. And I thought, oh, that's nice. <laughs> Two rarities side by side. So, uh, quite pleased with that. Uh, and it was a rather good day because I also found a mating pair. And what intrigued me about this particular shot is the difference in color between the male and the female. Uh, so you can see the male has got a more orangey color to the uh, paler female. And females are typically much harder to locate because they tend to disperse out of the breeding grounds once, they're, once they've mated. Um, I didn't find this pair like this. There's a bit of cheating going on because what 
I was walking out of uh, Glasgow and Wood and this thing, this movement caught my eye and underneath a, br a bracken front was a pair of matey checkered skippers flailing around. So I thought I'll just give them a helping hand and then they crawled up over onto the uh, top of the bracken front and then opened their wings, which was very kind of them. Um, so managed to get a uh, good experience there. Um, I revisited on the 13th of June, and that was the first time that I saw a checkered skipper lay an egg. Um, like many uh, skippers, what they do is they land on a leaf blade and then sort of shimmy down it and then deposit the egg. Uh, and one of the things I discovered after researching um, the ecology of the checkered skipper, in particular the work of Neil Ravenscroft, who uh, did his PhD thesis on the checkered skipper, um, was that the eggs are always laid on the side that doesn't hold the midrib of a leaf. So in, liter in literature, you'll find this confusing, um, uh, somewhat confusing accounts of some authors saying it lays its eggs on the top of a leaf and some on the underside of a leaf. What it actually lays on is the side that doesn't have the midrib. So depending on where the leaf is, you know, it's folded over one way or the other. Um, you know, is it the upper side or is it the underside? Well, actually, it's the side without the midrib, which most people would say is the upper side, but it may actually be facing downwards, if that makes sense. Uh, so already learning things about the checkered skipper from that perspective. Um, because this was, um, interestingly, when you go to Glaster and Wood, there's um, you know, normally quite a few people mulling around in, uh, in checkered skipper season, as you can imagine, um, because they all want to see the adults, and it's a very easy place to get to and, and to walk around. Um, if you go in September, you won't see a single person, and there are no midges, so an added bonus. But what I was looking for was to see if I could figure out whether or not I could locate a caterpillar. And the reason I thought I might be, might be able to was, and it did feel a bit like a needle in a haystack, but the reason I thought I could was there's very distinctive feeding damage that the checkered skipper causes, as do other skippers actually. Um, on the right here, you can see a tuft of purple moor grass. And this is what I was looking at, was to uh, look at these uh, blades that were growing up to see if there were the, uh, diagnostic, you know, the diagnostic feeding damage. Um, so uh, there are a few, um, God, did my heart get racing when I found my first sawfly caterpillar? Um, something I don't normally do, but if you think it's a checkered skipper larva, then, um, phone's going off. Uh, if you think it's a checkered skipper larva, then yeah, that will get the, the, the blood going. Um, and then there's also feeding damage as well can get you uh, somewhat excited. That, but when you realize that it's probably going to be caused by a leaf hopper or a drink a loft moth larva, which were, were also uh, in profusion there, um, you know, you start to get a bit uh, uh, disappointed at finding uh, what you think is larval feeding damage. And then I went back and looked at, um, so even though Neil Ravenscroft um, did a PhD on the checkered skipper. He also contributed to um, a sort of modest booklet from Butterfly Conservation, the cover of which is a view of Glasgow and Wood overlooking Loch Creran. And there's a particular uh, illustration in there um, that highlights one thing. The larval areas are on the flush soils. In other words, they're not at the top of the slope and they're not at the bottom of the slope. They're kind of at, towards the base, but not you know the complete bottom. And and I could almost hold this up to, uh, you know, the profile at Glaster and Wood and say, I've been looking in the wrong place. I should be further down the slope. Um, so that's where I went. And lo and behold, within about literally five minutes, I found the first checkered skipper uh, tube. Um, unfortunately, they were both um, empty. Um, obviously, I'm the one on the left, for example. You can see the tube, but the caterpillar's actually eaten everything above it and pretty much stripped everything below it and has undoubtedly moved on to uh, uh, to find another leaf blade as it as it grew. And on the right hand side, another example, uh, one of the interesting things I also found is that the checkered skipper tends to eat out notches in the grass blade and it's thought that that's to retain the nutrients above the grass blade. So when it's in its tube and it feeds above and below that tube, uh, obviously it's going to in, in a tube for, for protection, um, the nutrients are actually retained so it still gets um, uh, gets the nourishment it needs. And then I find another grass blade and I thought, oh, that looks like, um, you know, I was, I was just taking pictures of tubes and grass blades and this thing was more substantial. I was, as I was taking a picture of this, I had a tripod just to make sure the camera was stable. And I noticed that the leg of the tripod had hit um, another purple moor grass uh, tussock. 
Um, and there was another uh, construction. Essentially, it's two blades of grass that have been silked together. And because I'd knocked it, a caterpillar reversed out uh, from it. And this was the first time that I came face to anal flap with a checkered skipper caterpillar, as I always say. I also noticed this trick, which is if you gently tap the, um, the, the tube, it will reverse out further before crawling back in. So just by doing that, it reversed completely out. And there it was, my first uh, experience with a checkered skipper caterpillar. At the time, I thought it was in the penultimate instar, but this was actually a final instar caterpillar. So once I'd actually studied the, all of the different um, instars, I know that you know if it doesn't have a black head, it's final instar. And it's that kind of diagnostic that I thought was important. So that was 2014. And so I decided to come up with a plan for 2015, um, really spurred on by the fact that I'd managed to find a mating pair, an egg, a caterpillar. I thought, oh, this, this, this is going to be a lot of fun. So uh, I visited with a friend of mine, Mark Colvin, seven uh, sites, including the uh, Butterfly Conservation Reserve at Altmahuic on the banks of Loch Arcaig. Uh, Glenloy, the area around Steambridge, uh, near the C Commando Memorial, where apparently Richard Lewington's dad was the one of the models for uh, one of the three soldiers represented there. Um, someone said they all look like Richard Lewington's dad to me, so who knows. Um, Glen Nevis, Ariundel Woodlands, which is an incredible place. Uh, the head of Locketeve, and then Glasdrum Wood. And as I said, as you can see, Glasdrum Wood is the, was the most southerly site to them, which I uh, which I visited. And having visited all these sites, I actually converged up, verged on Glasdrum, not just because it was the most southerly site, but um, at Ariundel, for example, if, when I visited, I probably walked nine mi nine miles to go around the the entire site. And Glasdrum Wood is a much smaller uh, site, and, and therefore much easier to to cover. Uh, so, so in that year, yeah, had, had a lot of um, good success and managed to find uh, female laying eggs again. Um, and in the season, of course, there were other people at Glasgow and Wood. So I was telling them what I was doing. I said, if you see females laying eggs, let me know. And a few people did. And, um, uh, and they alerted me to new areas where females were laying, actually. Uh, and then I was able to follow the, the eggs through th um, over different visits and see the egg ultimately colouring up. And in the bottom right, you can see the head of the larva, uh, you know, uh, just a, a day or so before the caterpillar emerged. I was really lucky to see a caterpillar actually emerge from its egg. They do take quite a while to actually get themselves out. So, you know, you, you know, you know, you should stick around to see see the big event. Um, saw some, uh, you know, amazing experiences of caterpillars actually creating their tubes where they spread silk from one edge of, of a grass blade to another uh, and create these bands. And what you need to know is that um, when silk dries, it contracts. So initially the blade would just be sat there, but over time it would actually fold in on itself, creating the tube within the, which the caterpillar lived. So uh, great to see that and then following these things through. Um, uh, you know, having identified several areas where the caterpillars were, uh, following them through and um, yeah, just recording all of the different instars. So here we have the second instar, uh, the third instar. So in the middle shot, you can see the uh, larva poking at his head out the top. I say his head, I have no idea what sex it was. Um, her head. <laughs> But one of the things that you'll see in the third instar is the development of this black patch on the final segment. It's a sort of anvil shape, and it's very similar to the fourth instar larva. So again, you've still got a black head and you've got this black mark on uh, the last segment. But in the final instar, everything changes. The, the caterpillar now feeds more openly. Uh, it becomes uh, a very plainer green. It has a green head. And eventually, towards... Um, you know, the end of the season, it will build a hibernaculum. So, um, so I've tried to highlight where the hibernaculum is, um, but essentially it's another, you know, grass blades silk together. And inside that, the caterpillar creates a, a dense silk web within which it uh, overwinters. Now, the thing to notice here, just check the time. Yeah, we're still okay. Um, the thing to notice here is the caterpillar is green. It's a green caterpillar on green grass and it goes into hibernation as a green caterpillar. The following spring, though, 
obviously all of the purple mold grass, which is a deciduous, deciduous perennial, dies, dies back and is now straw colored. And the amazing thing about this, um, well, I'll come on to the amazing thing. The first thing is this is literally a needle in a haystack because the caterpillars, as they start to come out of hibernation, will wander. So you may think, you know, they're in this grass tussock, but then you find a caterpillar in the neighbouring tussocks. Uh, so what you need to do is call on help. And uh, I must thank Mark Colvin for, at his own expense, coming up to Scotland with me just to look for checkered skippers. You know, he's made of the right stuff, as I would say, but uh, an absolutely massive help in tracking down some of the uh, things that we were uh, looking for. But post hibernation, uh, this to me is a wonder of evolution. Post hibernation, the caterpillar is no longer green, it's straw colored. It doesn't feed any further, but it perfectly matches the dead purple moor grass blades. And eventually, so the caterpillar on the right um, has started to put some loose silk threads around some of the dead grass blades and has put a silk um, girdle around itself, which for me was um, just awesome because I knew this caterpillar was getting ready to pupate. More importantly, it wasn't going to move. So when I re on repeat visits, I knew where to find the thing. And eventually, uh, the thing that I was absolutely waiting for was to see, uh, I don't think I'd even seen a checkered skipper pupa photograph, let alone one for real, but to eventually find one that had pupated and then follow that through. Um, even to the point of colouring up was just amazing. Um, and despite many hours, many hours waiting for the big event, I never saw a checkered skipper emerge from its pupa. Uh, you'd think that the one on the right was about to emerge, but, uh, but no. Uh, and I think I measured that it was uh, in a pupa for 42 days, which is um, quite, uh, quite a long time for uh, any species. So what did I get from this? So in terms of recording, um, there, there was only uh, one individual I was managed to uh, follow all the way from egg to, um, to pupa. And uh, I eventually found the anti -pu pupil case as well. So I was able to estimate when it probably had um, uh, emerged. And uh, one of the things that surprised me is if I look at um, Frohawk's study, he, so he reared checkered skippers in captivity in England. And I monitored checkered skippers in the wild in northwest Scotland was just how close the um, the durations of the different stages were. Um, so L5 here. So, so L1, L2 and so on is um, the, the different instars. And I've broken up the, the final instar into uh, pre-hibernation, hibernation and post-hibernation. Um, and um, I kind of made some assumptions which were both wrong. I assumed it was colder and wetter in Scotland than in England. And I also assumed that adults emerge later in Scotland because it's you know so much further north than the English colonies. Um, what I discovered were that, um, was that thanks to the Gulf Stream, the Scottish climate in this area is actually quite relatively warm with mild winters. Uh, and based on the work of Ray Collier, who also uh, studied the checkered skipper, um, that the flight season was generally earlier in Scotland than in England. And if you put those two things together, then you can see that, well, okay, so they're similar and there are probably some reasons why, but I was just um, amazed that uh, just how close the correlation was. Um, and I also like to, um, I'm a kind of visual person, if that makes sense. So I like to see, see um, pictures enhancing anything that's written uh, in text. And if you think about a typical phonology chart of the different stages, uh, you know, this is a typical uh, visualization that you might see. Um, but what I was able to do was given the data was actually uh, create a much more detailed uh, version. So I could predict when each of the larval instars was likely to be appearing at Glasdrum Wood. And the data, um, so the black circles, um, uh, the filled circles are actual observations and the unfilled circles are um, a sort of calculation based on the work of Neil Ravenscroft, Ray Collier and myself. Um, so if you put all of that data together, then you can start to think about creating something like this. Um, so because I'm a bit of a nerd, I thought this was a nice thing to do. And, and it really made me think actually about what the potential was for um, butterfly and moth recording, actually, if we, you know, really do look at the uh, immature stages in detail. Um, so 
I presented my findings in this project at a butterfly conservation symposium. I had a poster session and um, just opposite me was Rachel Jones and we got chatting and Rachel is studying uh, the Lulworth skipper for a PhD. Um, and I said, if I, if I were to um, get you the photos I've got of Lulworth skipper uh, life cycle stages, could you test it out? And she said, sure. And um, you probably can't see it, but at the bottom of her tweet, um, there's a first instar caterpillar. And I sent her this photo and she was able to correlate the two and say, this is really good. You, you, you know, I can actually not only say I found the larvae, but I can actually record which instar they're in as well. I thought, okay, this is a good start. Then Martin Warren, who I'm sure many, many of us know, uh, the former chief executive of butterfly conservation, he's now head of development at um, BC Europe. Uh, he was helping Rachel and he sent me five photos, I think it was, and said, what do you think these are? And he didn't give me any clues. <laughs> so, so, I, so I thought, well, what are the potential candidates here? So, so it's gonna be, um, so, so you've got to remember, this is a Lulworth skipper site, uh, Bind Bindon Hill, I think, in uh, Dorset, just above Lulworth Cove. Well, it's going to, you know, these photos are either going to be of Essex skipper, small skipper, Lulworth skipper, or large skipper. Um, and I created this table, essentially. And there are some clues based on food, larval food plant, because the preference for Essex skipper and large skipper is Coxfoot, small skipper is Yorkshire Fog, and Lulworth skipper, if you read all the books, it's, it's tall grass. Um, so I created this table and uh, I sort of honed in. Once this table had been created, I was able to quite quickly correlate Martin's photos with what I thought uh, these things were. Um, and I sent Martin the table, but I didn't tell him what I thought each of his photos was. I said, right, I've done this. You tell me what you think they are. And we came up with a perfect match. So I thought, good. <laughs> no bribery involved, uh, an independent assessment of whether or not this um, catalogue of... Uh, uh, photos was actually uh, of use, as well as the uh, additional information such as the size, you know, the length of the lava, um, which is also helpful as well, of course. Um, okay, for sake of time, how are we doing? I'd like I'd like to go to Q and A actually. The, the, I could talk about this stuff for hours and often do. Um, but let me just. We still got eight minutes, Pete, and we don't have that many questions at the moment, actually. Okay, so let, let me just go for another five. Yeah, minutes. thank, thank, thanks, Epiphany. Okay, so um, I sometimes feel like I'm trying to cram in as many <laughs> slides as possible, but just some things to be aware of in terms of identification challenges is that things um, change over time, including the color of eggs. So everyone is probably familiar with the changing color of an orange tip egg, but did you know that the color uh, Dingy skipper egg also changes colour similarly. Um, it's thought that this colour change in orange tips is um, because the larvae are cannibalistic and that if there is an egg already present on the food plant, so garlic, mustard or cuckoo flour, that it kind of alerts the female to not lay another egg because that egg is, or the uh, offspring is likely to get eaten. Um, but why does that happen in the dingy skipper who whose larvae are not cannibalistic. And my theory is that it may alert a female to the presence of an egg um, to discourage her from laying another egg so that the larva doesn't outstrip the supply of food plant, which is normally uh, bird's foot trefoil, uh, certainly in my part of the world. They'll, they'll feed on horseshoe vetch as well. Uh, but that's my theory. So just being aware that, you know, there are these um, color changes. There are also different forms of larvae. Um, so um, in, uh, you know, several parts of the British Isles. We have the marbled white, which, which is what I'm showing here, but you get similar forms appearing in other species as well. Um, and again, thanks to Mark for the photo here. Um, but if you go out at, at dusk, then you can um, see the larvae start to crawl up the, um, the grass stems as they feed, because they stay very much hunkered down uh, normally. Uh, and I guess one of my questions for Douglas uh, in the next talk is that, you know, in terms of moths and uh, some of the challenges with light pollution is, um, has everyone ever, ever looked at the impact of this on the immature stages, in particular caterpillars, which may not, you know, come up as far as they might otherwise do, there's still a lot, a lot of light around in their feeding. Uh, there's also variation in pupae, which you also need to be uh, aware of. Uh, again, these aren't Scottish examples, uh, apologies for that, but in the black hair streak, there are different colour forms of uh, pupae. Same in wall brown, for example. Um, 
Uh, another challenge is uh, camouflage subjects. So uh, on the left there, you've got black hair streak eggs, which um, unlike the brown hair streak, which lays white eggs on black thorn, the black hair streak lays very camouflaged eggs on black thorn, much, much harder to find. Uh, and on the right here, you can see, uh, or maybe you can see, but this is a white letter hair streak caterpillar on elm flowers. Um, I don't know if you can see my mouse, but the caterpillar is down here. So on the right, bottom right hand side, perfectly camouflaged against the, the elm flowers there. Um, one of the other challenges is that some of the things you need to look for are hidden. And we looked at the checkered skipper caterpillar in its tree on the right there. On the left, you've got small skipper eggs, which are laid in a grass sheath. Um, so you actually need to prise open a sheath to actually find the eggs. Um, I once saw a, a small skipper lay its eggs at Stockbridge Down uh, in a particular sheath, and I thought, oh, I'll open that, this up just to uh, see how many she's laid and record that. And I found five different batches from different females in the same sheath. I thought, you know, so clearly there's something to do with the microclimate uh, going on there. And then in the middle here, this is a small blue caterpillar, which has burrowed its way into a floret of kidney vetch. So that's its sole larval food plant. So you can just make out a dark figure in the middle of the photo. That is the caterpillar feeding on the uh, ovaries inside the floret. Uh, and again, you know, um, I, so I was using my phone to actually backlight some of these florets. You do need to be careful because they will snap off, but just to see whether or not I could locate um, some of the early instars of a small blue uh, butterfly. Now, finally, uh, to my point earlier, you know, we, we still have subjects which are nocturnal. You won't, you won't easily find them during the day unless you're going to get really down into the bowels of a grass tussock. In the case of the left, you've got a meadow brown final instar caterpillar. Um, it's, it's amazing. I'm surprised more people don't go out at night looking for caterpillars, but I know, like I said, I'm a bit of a nerd, but uh, in, in the right spots, you can go out with a head torch or what have you, and there are just caterpillars everywhere. Uh, I think uh, when I went to Stockbridge Down once, uh, looking for marbled white larvae, I counted something like 150 marbled white larvae and 20 meadow browns uh, in about 20 minutes. They were just so visible. Um, and on the right here, you've got Duke of Burgundy larvae, uh, in this case, feed, feeding on uh, primrose. Um, and again, they'll come out and um, there's distinctive feeding damage, which uh, gives their presence away. So my conclusions are that, you know, this interest in immature stages does add a new dimension to butterfly recording. Uh, it's not for the faint hearted by any means. Uh, this is a, what is it, it's a second in star white admiral caterpillar. Uh, so I, I've been studying white admiral um, uh, for probably about a decade now. Um, and uh, yeah, I've got, uh, I've become very familiar with how you tell the different instars apart. So because this one's slightly spiky, uh, I know it's a second in star larva. Um, but, you know, some obvious things we can do, you can, you know, measure changes in phenology over time, distribution and population uh, over time, um, which, you know, will infer certain things such as habitat suitability, uh, effectiveness of any habitat management that's going on in, and the impact of climate change. Um, and it's been an absolute joy uh, getting to know butterflies from a very different angle uh, and actually pulling together um, uh, the resources that you now have available to you and uh, as, as you've got on you know the title says it all here there are no excuses for not also doing this yourselves so with the uh, amazing caterpillar book from uh, barry and phil uh, and richard of course um uh, there's also an offer if you want to get uh, the the book that i pulled together from nature bureau as a discount code scott 20 i tried it this morning and it didn't work so hopefully it will start to work um on monday after i've spoken to nature bureau but uh but yeah, thanks for listening. And uh, yeah, I'll open it up for questions. Thank you, Pete. That's all really impressive. I'm pleased to hear you've been enjoying our Scottish butterflies and apologies about the midges. <laughs> um, yeah, there are people commenting in the chat that they had no idea there were so many subspecies and also comments about how superb your book is. Highly recommended. Um, so will. we've got time for a few questions. Um, let's take one from Jim Asher first, another keen photographer. He wants to know what lens did you use to capture the early stages because they're very impressive photographs and did you use image stacking? 
Uh, so there's a couple of lenses because obviously it depends on uh, the size of the subject. Um, so I generally use a Sigma 150 millimeter lens uh, for things like final instar larvae and uh, later instars. When you get down to the early instar larvae and eggs, um, I use um, Canon's MPE 65 millimeter, which is five time magnification macro, uh, which is very, very exp expensive and it's very specialized. And you have to use a tripod. Um, I also use something called a Wimberley plant to hold maybe a grass blade in place or so on. But it does give me, um, uh, you, you know, keeps things very, very stable. And yes, on occasion, I do use image stacking. And I will do that by just simply moving the lens. So I don't use a rail, but... Uh, uh, you know, it's not, not the right way to go about stacking, and I know that, but um, it is, man, it, you know, it gives me the ability to, uh, given the narrow depth of field, to build an image from uh, a series of images, which is, you know, what image stacking is all about. So on occasion, yes, I've, I've done that as well. Great, thank you. Next up um, from Lee, what is the advantage of a caterpillar backing out of its protective tube when the grass stalk is tested? <laughs> <laughs> That's a good question. Uh, so it doesn't get a headache, I guess. No, I, th I think it's because the um, uh, it's the potential for some kind of predator um, to be, uh, you know, maybe entering the tubes. So the kind of vibrations it, it, that it experiences may give the impression that there's, um, um, you know, some kind of bug or a spider or something trying to get into the grass tube itself. And it will, uh, so I tapped it at the top of the tube. If I tapped at the bottom, it would move out the top. Um, so I'm pretty sure it's uh, predator evasion. Um, and ultimately, I think if I continue tapping, it would probably have fallen to the ground, into the tussock, and then crawled up again and built a, another tube. Yep. Um, so I'm going to take one more question so that we don't run over. But uh, just to let you know that all questions will be answered and emailed out afterwards. So don't worry about that. Um, one from David Hood, which says, uh, thank you, really interesting talk. You mentioned that DNA studies are resolving some questions of taxonomy. Can you say roughly how many species of butterflies and moths have now had their genome mapped? Unfortunately, I don't know. Um, I tend to um, I have quite a narrow focus in the sense that I focus on butterflies of Britain and Ireland. Um, uh, I'd probably say about 10%. It's quite a small number at this stage, but um, as the DNA techniques are becoming more mainstream actually because it used to be really expensive to uh, uh, you know get the genome of a given uh, species but the techniques are becoming much much cheaper to do uh, so hopefully we'll start to see uh, see this grow and actually get for me I would really like some stability in terms of the taxonomy and um, the checklist that we use um, mainly for conservation reasons actually so that we can claim that the records we're seeing are of a particular species or subspecies and then uh, conserve things uh, appropriately but yeah good questions great thank you pete um and if you have a look in the chat you'll see how much people enjoyed your talk so thank you very yeah. much for joining us yeah, today thanks everyone and we'll get the rest of the questions to you um so that you can answer them so next up, we have a very accomplished young lepidopterist, uh, Doug Boyes, who's been involved with BC for many years as a county butterfly recorder. He's done great work for BC in hi highlighting under-recorded areas and encouraging people to get out and enjoy moths. Previously, Doug has completed some interesting work on micromoths found in bird's nests, but he's here today to talk about his PhD project at the Centre for Ecology and Hydrology. So Doug, uh, welcome to Scotland, albeit virtually, and over to you when you're ready. Excellent. Uh, it's great to be here. Um, uh, uh, thanks for inviting me. Um, and thanks for a great talk to kick us off, Pete. I will come back to your question about uh, butterflies and, and light pollution uh, later on. So um, yeah, a nice one to raise. Um, so can you see my screen, please? Yep, um, looks good. Perfect, right. So uh, yeah, I'm uh, doing a PhD at the moment uh, looking at the impacts of light pollution on moths and I'm specifically interested in the question um, of, of whether light pollution is contributing to the ongoing signs in, in British moths. Um, but I'll just quickly tell you a little bit about me to sort of uh, explain the journey that I've taken to, um, to doing a PhD on moths. So I, I grew up on the um, English-Welsh border in Montgomeryshire 
uh, began moss trapping when I was uh, 12. Um, and uh, when I learned to drive, that was really when my interest uh, sort of obsession maybe uh, took off. And I set about exploring the least recorded parts of Montgomery uh, um, in, in, in the run up to the Atlas and um, really had some very enjoyable and exciting excursions. I'm now based down in Oxfordshire um, and I'm now getting paid to catch moths at Whiteham Woods, uh, which is a bit of a dream job really. I'm collecting lots of specimens for the Darwin Tree of Life project, which is this uh, um, idea to sequence the whole genomes of all British species. And I'm finding all sorts of fantastic uh, moths like these. Um, my uh, recording activities have been uh, slightly curtailed by um, academic studies um, and I've managed to sort of uh, keep moths uh, fairly uh, high up um, throughout my studies. So for my undergraduate, I looked at micromoths in bird nests and then for my master's dissertation, I uh, examined the um, species of macromoth in Britain, which are becoming more common. And now I'm based at the UK Centre for Ecology and Hydrology, uh, where my, my focus is on uh, light pollution. So I would usually begin this talk by uh, explaining why moths are important and why we should be worried about moth declines, but I'm going to assume I'd be preaching to the choir um, today. So I'm just going to dive straight in and talk a little bit about uh, what might be causing the declines in British moth. So this is a uh, graph, these are graphs from uh, the recent State of uh, Britain's Larger Moth Report, which I'd highly recommend uh, checking out if you've not seen it, um, just, just stick the title in Google. And um, yeah, what it's revealed is a, a, a drop of a, a third of the number of uh, macromoths caught by uh, roth hamster traps over uh, the last 50 years or so. And if I were given this talk uh, three or four years ago, um, you folks up in Scotland would have gotten off pretty lightly, really, because the, the declines until recently had been pretty, or, or the trend had been pretty stable. Um, but now uh, we're beginning to see, uh, after a run of really bad years, uh, significant declines uh, in the northern half of Britain, though they are steeper in the south. And there are lots of um, possible factors that intensify across this north-south gradient that could be responsible for this pattern. And these include habitat changes, uh, which is perhaps most important. So these are related to agriculture, larger field size, sizes, um, also housing developments. And of course, a suite of um, pollution, chemical pollution um, of, of pesticides and of, of, of nitrogen uh, that, that is associated with uh, agricultural intensification. Climate change, personally, I think is, is really important for our, our, our moth declines and will we'll get more and more important. So this uh, garden tiger um, has, uh, has been a real loser um, of, uh, of, uh, in its trends and it's disappeared from much of its southern range. It's probably still doing OK in, in Scotland, I thought. Um, but it, this decline has been linked to the increasing frequency of, of warm, wet winters that we're having uh, in the UK as a result of climate change. And this paper here has um, it attributed 50% of negative population uh, changes in British moths to climate change. So really, uh, I think climate change is already having quite a severe uh, negative impacts on our moths. And all these factors have been discussed by, by Richard Fox uh, in his 2013 review and, and indeed in, in subsequent uh, reports by BC. I put sort of question marks by some of these factors where the, uh, the quality of evidence is, um, or the quantity of evidence is, is, is perhaps a, bit, a little less than some of those other factors. And uh, it's obviously light pollution that I'm going to focus on today. So, um, if we if, if we take the assumption that, that light is is driving uh, declines in, in our moths, it, it's useful to consider how this might be happening. And um, to link nicely with uh, Pete's talk, uh, I'm going to take a, a life cycle approach to, to, to answering this question and uh, examine some of these factors throughout uh, the life cycles of, of, of moths. So um, we know that, that moths, uh, most moths are nocturnal, and it's good evidence that, that even low levels of artificial light can just stop nocturnal moths becoming active. Perhaps the most obvious suite of mechanisms uh, revolve around phototaxis, this idea that moths are um, 
uh, attracted to light and, and, and this can cause them uh, lost time that they would otherwise be spending reproducing or indeed uh, direct mortality uh, as well as bat predation. Anyone who runs a moth trap will, will know that birds can quite quickly become wise to lighting um, and perhaps this is happening across the countryside. Some people have talked about long distance uh, navigation being disrupted by, uh, by light because moths, uh, some moths navigate using celestial uh, cues. Perhaps a more uh, important factor could be short distance dispersal. So you can imagine a linear feature of, of lighting like this. If this is preventing moths from this area of habitat from, from crossing over um, and reaching this habitat, you, you could effectively have population fragmentation um, or, or for these moths. There's a suite of mechanisms around reproduction, and it's quite clear that it, in moths, uh, at least, uh, reproduction is very closely linked to the day-night cycle, and even low levels of light can, can disrupt this and really re, uh, re reduce reproductive success. Many moth uh, caterpillars and some butterfly caterpillars are nocturnal in their feeding habits. So um, we've hypothesized that um, uh, light could actually be having a negative impact on, on feeding behaviors of, of larvae. And larvae may also suffer increased parasitism by, by, by the tiny wasps or, or predation by, by things like birds. And then there's also some uh, effects with development. So um, lab studies have shown that um, um, caterpillars reared under low levels of, of light uh, reach uh, final uh, lower body mass, which would be a smaller adult, which would probably be less fit. And then they can also fail to hibernate, essentially. And it, it, it's thought that if they do that, they would suffer very high uh, winter mortality. So really the take home here is that um, there are potential mechanisms uh, right throughout the uh, life cycle. And it, it's not just as simple as moths flying up to, uh, to a bright light. And we can uh, group these uh, mechanisms according to the mode of action. Uh, and the most significant ones really are, are, are light being perceived as daylight, um, and phototaxis, this idea of, of moths being attracted to light. And uh, as, sort of as Peter mentioned, that, that butterflies uh, uh, have, uh, some butterflies have nocturnal larvae, uh, um, and also circadian processes uh, could easily be uh, disrupted in, in species which are day flying. And this idea of, of, of day flying insects being affected by light pollution hasn't really been studied much, but it, it's certainly plausible. And uh, it, it's something that I'm currently doing uh, some field work to investigate. Um, what I've talked about so far has mostly been uh, effects at an individual level, effects on individuals rather than um, whole populations or, or, or communities. So uh, that's what I'll move on to talk about now. And uh, statements like these, uh, which some of you may have seen this is a couple of years old now, um, aren't really supported by the, by the evidence, unfortunately. It's, this headline annoyed me a little bit. Um, uh, because the evidence just, just, just doesn't support this at present. Uh, the, the strongest evidence that, that light pollution might be uh, impacting on, on insect declines comes from moths. Uh, there's a, a, a nice uh, correlative study um, from, from Holland, which, which identifies um, stronger declines in, in, in night flying species that are attracted to, more strongly attracted to light. But the, perhaps the best study uh, so far is this, this experimental one where they installed streetlights in nature reserves in Holland and after five years they found a 14% reduction in uh, macro moths um, in, in the areas with streetlights. And then light can also impact on processes uh, through those uh, sorts of mechanisms that I discussed earlier and one of the key processes that has re received the most study is pollination. And um, yeah, this has really, really become a, a sort of a, a popular field uh, for, for research. And there's growing evidence that um, uh, it, artificial light, light pollution can reduce plant fitness mediated through uh, disruptive effects on, on moths. So um, all, all of what I've just sort of gone through is contained in a, a review that we had published at the end of last year. It's completely open access. Anyone can read it. Um, for free. So if you are 
interested in, in sort of uh, delving in a, a little more, uh, do check that out. Um, and I'm going to move on now to talk a, a bit about um, some of the field work that I've been doing over the last three years. And these are the sort of exotic sites that I've, I've been spending my time um, at, uh, roundabouts and, and road, road verges. And I've had a network of 27 field sites throughout Oxfordshire, Buckinghamshire and Berkshire. And at each of these dots is a pair. And, and, and this is a, a, what's called a natural matched pairs design experiment. So uh, what I've done is I've gone out and, and found areas of habitat that are lit by street lighting. And then I compare them with um, adjacent habitat that is unlit, but is otherwise identical. So it's the same species of um, he hedge plant. It's the same height. It's the same. It's been managed the same. So we can be fairly confident that any differences in the in the communities are, are due to light and not due to other factors, at least when it's uh, scaled up across all those different um, sites. And I've been very much focused on caterpillars because if you find an adult moth here, it may well have flown from a, a, a neighboring area, whereas caterpillars are much more, um, they don't disperse very much by and large and therefore um, any effects are gonna be quite localized and should be therefore quite detectable. So I've been using two uh, methods uh, to sample caterpillars. One of these is, is beaching of hedgerows, which is really productive in the, um, in the spring. And uh, with things like winter moth, uh, it's, it's winter flying geometrids and some summer flying micromoth that, that make up these communities. But through this method, I've estimated that 100, 100 meter stretch of this rather a uh, boring looking hawthorn uh, hedge is home to 21,000 moth caterpillars. So hugely uh, productive um, method of sampling. Uh, a slightly less productive method, uh, but still important is, is, is this one of, of sweeping grassy verges, uh, which uh, have to do at night because these caterpillars are nocturnal. And it's um, uh, uh, things, like, uh, things like these, uh, zestias, um, square spot rustics, Cetaceous Hebrew characters, the odd butterfly, uh, particularly marbled whites, um, uh, coming up uh, from, from this. And I learned a very valuable lesson that as an ecologist, regardless of what weird stuff you're up to, if you have a, a high vis jacket on and a flashing light on your car, absolutely no one will batter an eyelid at what you're doing, which is uh, really quite handy. So the results, well, um, unfortunately, I can't quite share the uh, exact results uh, publicly just yet. They, they'll be uh, uh, published hopefully uh, later this year. But uh, the results were quite striking. And we did find uh, that uh, almost all sites, there were fewer caterpillars under the streetlights. So um, yeah, it, it does seem that, uh, that light pollution is having a, a negative effect on, on the local abundances of caterpillars. So some of the other work that I've been doing is trying a, a bit of a, a thought experiment to try and work out how important light is at a landscape scale. So this uses uh, council databases of, of streetlights, each dot is a streetlight. It uses uh, roadmap data uh, and estimated uh, road widths, and it uses land use data, um, uh, which, which you can see the sort of suburban areas here. These are all clusters as, as little pockets of suburban land, and it, it groups or, um, or, all of the UK into these parcels of, of, of different uh, habitats. So um, what I've done is I've put a, a, a buffer, a radius, a circle around each streetlight uh, proportional to its height to estimate the lit area. So these very tall, bright streetlights on a motorway intersection um, illuminate a much wider area uh, than a, a small residential streetlight. Now I can assume that, that, that a road surface isn't a very suitable habitat for a caterpillar, so I can remove that area. And then probably also remove those urban um, land uses, which are you know, industrial units, which again, probably don't have many caterpillars. And then I repeat this across my study region, um, which is all these local authorities, which kindly responded to my freedom of information requests, as well as Highways England. 
and it's uh, it was about 160,000 individual streetlights which made up uh, this area. And from this, I estimate that uh, around 7,000 hectares, uh, or 1.3 percent of the land area, is directly lit by street lighting. And, and, and for some context, the, the Wildlife Trust that encompasses the same area has reserves um, uh, totaling about 3,000 hectares. So is that a lot of the landscape? Is that a little? Well, I'll, I'll maybe leave that uh, for you to uh, make your own judgment. Uh, there's significant regional variation. So an urbanized place like Slough has a much higher area than um, the more leafy Buckinghamshire. And then perhaps more importantly, the land uses differ as you would expect. So suburban areas are very highly lit. Whereas more rural habitats, perhaps more um, um, relevant for, for sort of what the, the declines in wider country species that we've been seeing are actually illuminated at really very low rates. So 0.6% of woodland and 0.2% of, uh, of arable. Of course, if you uh, say that moths are maybe attracted in from surrounding areas, uh, then the, the land affected would be, would be a bit greater, but there's not a huge amount of evidence that moths are lured in from, from great distances. So I think from this, we can be reasonably confident that light pollution is probably not the main factor responsible for these national declines in, in the moths that we've been seeing. But certainly from my field work, it's clearly uh, a, an important local factor. And the amount of, of street lighting is not static. Uh, the, um, four of my field sites in, in the three years that, that I've been doing it have since uh, had new street lights installed at them. And this is to facilitate new developments. Uh, this field that I'm standing in uh, is in the process of becoming a new housing estate. So uh, if that percentage of land continues to creep up, perhaps towards 5 10% in places, then there may be light pollution uh, uh, could be a, a much more significant um, factor. But regardless maybe of, of how important it is at a national scale, one of the really nice things about this topic is that there are solutions and um, other areas like climate change and, and habitat um, changes are, are a bit more difficult really to find solutions for. There are solutions, of course, but the solutions for lighting are really quite accessible potentially. So we've, we've got changes ongoing in um, lighting technology with old sodium lighting typically being replaced by uh, white LEDs. And this um, unfortunately is predicted to have uh, quite negative effects for wildlife because the, um, the, the spectral composition of a white LED is quite similar to daylight compared to the sodium lighting and, and therefore is predicted to have uh, more negative impacts on a, a wider range of biological processes. But LEDs don't have to be white and uh, can, can, can be any color. Um, and some studies have found that uh, by using red LEDs in particular, um, that the uh, negative um, effects on moths, so this is on reproduction, and this is on uh, caterpillar development, can be mitigated to some extent and are a bit more similar to the dark controls compared to either green or white LEDs. But it's worth noting that not all of the studies have found that uh, red LEDs do actually mitigate this, um, and some have found that red LEDs are just as bad. So. Um, Ideally, uh, uh, switching uh, lights off is um, a better solution. But of course, that's not always um, possible or indeed desirable. I think the sort of uh, tragic events of Sarah Everand in, uh, this week and the sort of subsequent discussions over, over safety has really reinforced to me the idea that um, while I may feel completely safe uh, uh, on a dark street, uh, not everyone does. So uh, I think we need to be a little bit careful before saying oh, we should just turn off all our street lights. Um, but perhaps technology can um, come to the rescue. And this is a, a train station uh, near where I live. And uh, there aren't people on the platform for, for the whole night. So it has motion sensors and the, and the lights are only on when they need to be. And this slightly more sci-fi example 
shows uh, 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 streetlights on a, on a road only being on um, when uh, as cars are driving along and turning it off for, for the rest of the time. So perhaps these sorts of uh, solutions could go uh, some way in uh, reducing the impact on wildlife while still uh, maintaining uh, the benefits of, of lighting for, 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 for people. So uh, just to wrap up then, um, we've got really uh, good evidence that uh, light pollution can impact on, on all sorts of key behaviours of moths right across the life cycle and potentially also impact on day flying insects too. Uh, light pollution, uh, I think is uh, safe to say, can be a, a, a local factor, certainly in, in, in populations and, and for local declines. But whether that scales up to it being a really important factor at the national scale is less uh, clear, I think. But I think there is enough evidence for a precautionary approach to be adopted. And uh, there are some really nice, easy solutions available for lighting although their exact um, efficacy has not necessarily been uh, that well studied for insects as yet. They're a bit better studied for groups like bats, for instance. So uh, it, it just remains for me to thank a few people. My supervisory team um, listed there, my funders who are, who are NERC and uh, Butterfly Conservation, uh, landowners um, for, for letting me uh, use um, their um, use their land for, for my field work. And uh, thank you uh, again for inviting me and thank you for listening. Thank you very much, Doug. That was really interesting. Uh, we often spend these meetings sharing lots of nice photos about the great things that we've seen, but of course it's really important to have some important messages about declines in here as well. So we've ran into the break a little bit, but I will take one question. Um, so you mentioned that artificial light might cause increased parasitism of caterpillars or, or might affect caterpillar populations. Could you tell us a little bit more about that? Yeah, sure. So um, parasitoids, if, if people aren't familiar, are just uh, little wasps that um, lay their eggs in caterpillars. They'll um, then generally kill the caterpillar. Uh, but these parasitoid wasps are generally day flying. And it's been found in some other insect groups, so aphids in particular, that, uh, the, um, that the, if there's uh, levels of, of light at night, these day flying insects can become active at night. So therefore have much more time to be hunting and finding, um, finding their prey. So they'll, uh, yeah, you'll get higher rates of parasitism, but uh, it's not actually been tested in caterpillars yet although that's something I'm currently uh, doing. So we'll, we'll see if it's, uh, we'll see if it's a factor in caterpillars, hopefully, fairly soon. Great, thanks for that. And there were, there were lots of people asking about LED lights as well, which you obviously came to at the end of your presentation. Good morning. Uh, welcome to a wonderful, wonderful sunny King Issy. You can see there behind me the uh, the blue sky. I have I've come outside because although I live in a lovely house, um, it is very dark. So uh, it's much nicer to come out and uh, show you a few things out here than uh, than it is sat in my uh, very dark and uh, cold house. Um, so. Knowing that we were having live moths today, what we would normally do if we were at Battleby is that we would all gather outside, having ha had some wonderful food, and we would have gone through the, the moth traps that would have run around the grounds. So we're having to do it a little bit differently uh, this year. So what I initially did was that uh, I tried to get a few volunteers to, to help out and run traps throughout Scotland. And uh, I got lots of uh, responses saying we were catching very few moths. Um, so the, I'm going to go through some of the responses that I got from some of the people around uh, Scotland. So because of the cold weather, particularly at night, uh, there's just been very few moths around. So um, Ian Leach down in Newton Stewart has said that it's been pretty hopeless for trapping so far this year. Gales, torrential rain, snow, frost, etc, etc. Um, so not very hopeful. He's had his trap out four times in his garden. Um, his best catch was on the 5th of February when he caught um, 27 spring ushers, nine pale brindle beauties, nine uh, mottled umbers. And a few nights later, 
um, oak beauties and pale brindle beauties again, seven March moths. So people have been catching a few bits and bobs. Um, on Mull, I contacted Alan Skeets, who's the moth recorder on Mull. And again, similar response, a very slow start to the season. No sign yet of the usual spring hordes of moths. Because if you get a mild night in the spring, you can get vast numbers of moths. His neighbour, Chris, has been uh, doing a bit of trapping. He's been putting out a bit of sugar, putting out a few wine ropes, and uh, he's been catching a few things. The usual suspects, things like dotted borders, March moth, uh, satellite. Uh, he caught a couple of satellites, which is very useful uh, because of my... Uh, because. When two satellite moths met in the trap, uh, they got together, they became very friendly, um, they got married. Uh, the, the, uh, the wedding wasn't very good, but the reception was wonderful. Uh, Graham Crittenden in West Sutherland, uh, again, slim pickings, he says, on the north coast. He's only had his trap out four times, one chestnut, one dotted border. Barry Blake in Gairlock, again, very few moths, though he did get an oak beauty. Uh, which was only the second record for, uh, for that part of Scotland and um, possibly only the second north of Loch Arbor. But other people haven't just been relying on looking at their traps. Malcolm Lindsay in Gala Shields has been out and about looking in the seeds heads of knatweed and he's checked and brought back over 300 seed heads of knatweed to eventually find a single caterpillar of Metzneria metzneriella, which is a, a very small micro moth, which he was after. So it shows you the dedication there of some of our recorders. Uh, Barry Prater, also in the borders, um, he's had slim pickings too, not many, not hardly put his trap out because of the cold weather. Um, dark chestnut was his uh, highlight. Uh, although it's a species he gets from time to time, but he's been out looking for caterpillars and he's been out, out on the coast uh, looking on uh, lichen clad rocks where he's been finding dew moth caterpillars. And what he says is really interesting is that he's found dew moth caterpillars throughout the year, every month of the year, apart from July. So it's good to know that they're there about. Now, I'm doing a bit of padding here because it was minus two last night and because I've had my trap out for a whole week, I've only caught a couple of moths. So I'm gonna show you my moths, but this is a pale brindle beauty. Um, it's out, uh, it's one of the earliest moths that we see. Um, it's on the wing sometimes uh, from January, certainly through February, March, sort of into uh, May. You can see it's a little bit breezy here and uh, the, the, the wind is just getting up under its, uh, under its wings. Now this is the male. I can tell that because uh, the females is, is one of these species that does not have wings. So it's very easy to tell that this is a, a male. Um, later in the year, probably uh, next month and certainly into May, we get its cousin, the brindle beauty, which is very, very similar. Uh, it tends to be a much more golden color. Um, the, the dark markings across the wings tend to be a little bit darker. Um, so what surprises me is that the pale, the, the brindle beauty has a bigger body, has a hairier body, whereas the, the body of the male pale brindle beauty, which we're looking at now, is a much more sort of thinner uh, pencil like. Um, you'd have thought with this one coming with the pale brindle beauty coming out a lot earlier in the colder weather, it would be the one with the bigger hairier body. Also, the brindle beauty. The males have wonderful feathery antennae. You just can't miss that. Um, so that, that's one of the ways to tell the difference between the male pale brindle beauties and the brindle beauties. The only other moths that I've caught so far this year are chestnuts. Um, they're over behind me, so I won't go there to show you them because I'll probably lose my signal. Um, so it has really been very, very slim pickings for me here. It's just been far too cold. As I say, it was minus two here last night and it's hardly been above freezing in the nights um, up until uh, you know, over the last week. So uh, with that, my friend, Nigel Bowden, who lives on the Fife Coast, um, he always gets lots of moths. And even despite the cold weather, he's been having his trap out and we'll go across to Nigel in Fife and see what he's been catching. Thank you. Thanks, Tom. 
Let me just get my screen shared. <clears throat> Hopefully you can all see a nice Hebrew character now. Um, yeah, so um, I had my trap out in the garden last night. Um, it wasn't ideal conditions. I wouldn't normally have trapped, except we were looking to try and get some moths uh, to show everyone today. Um, it dropped to about two degrees overnight. and wasn't any warmer than four and a half at the warmest point. Um, there's a wee bit of rain between nine and ten, but there was uh, only a light westerly wind, which was the main reason that I managed to actually catch a few things. Um, and the numbers last night were 37 moths in total of five different species. Um, that might sound like a decent catch, um, but uh, by comparison to some of the time here in March, um, it's relatively low. Um, so if we get good conditions here, I can catch up to three, 400 moths in an eye of maybe between 20, 25 species. Um, looking at next week's weather, um, might be getting a lot more, but unfortunately um, we don't get to plan the weather in advance. So I'll show you what I have got. Um, Tom mentioned already about what we call the spring rush, which is um, uh, when you get uh, quite uh, large numbers of moths appearing at this time of year. Um, although the diversity is not as high as summer, um, the numbers can be truly spectacular. I've uh, recorded, I think the highest number in this garden here in one night was 480 moths a couple of years ago in, in late March. Um, and the same year I trapped at Lot Rannock. Um, and I remember getting over a thousand moths in one trap at the end of March and uh, about two and a half thousand moths in total uh, across about six traps I had out that night. So spectacular numbers. The bulk of those numbers are made up by moths in the genus of Orthosia. So these are noctuid moths. Um, the two most common ones are common quaker and Hebrew character. So we'll start off with Hebrew character. Um, so sort of grayish, brownish or reddish brown ground mass. Um, and then they have a variable blackish mark on the wing, which I'll point out with my mouse there. And this is what gives the moth its name. So um, it's named after the 14th letter of the Hebrew alphabet, which I've no idea how to pronounce it, but it's written none. Um, and it looks quite similar to, to that, uh, that letter, hence it's named Hebrew character. But blackish mark is quite variable. It can be uh, complete as in this individual, it can be broken. And the further north you go in Scotland, um, it can even be brown, reddish brown, not even black at all in coloration. They can look quite different. So last night I caught about 20 Hebrew characters. They were the commonest moths. I'll just move around and show you some of the different ones I've got in the pot here. And oops, and another one there. And these are all quite similar. The, um, the, uh, the black mark is fairly constant across these ones. There's one with a slightly more defined black mark. There's one there. Uh, on the side of the container, you can just about see the black mark is actually broken in the middle. So those are Hebrew characters. Move them away and see if we can get some common Quakers. All right, so this is common Quaker. Um, so quite a variable ground mass coloration. Ground mass coloration can be greyish, greyish brown, sandy, um, to sort of warmer pinker browns, and even to much darker colours. Um, they have quite a large kidney and oval marks there, which are outlined in this pale coloration, and then they've got this pale subterminal band. So I'll just show you a couple of different examples. There's a regular sort of sandy looking one, there's a slightly um, more pinkish coloured one, and there's a nice one over here. Get that. Just apologize. Everything's back to front with this USB microscope I'm using, so I have to move things in the opposite direction to what it looks like on the screen. It's a bit confusing for my small brain. Um, so there's a nice fresh example. Um, so those are your common Quakers. Um, there are several other species that are quite similar that normally I would hope to have some examples of, but um, unfortunately, because it wasn't ideal conditions last night. So you have things like small Quaker, which is a bit smaller than common Quaker. Um, less well-defined oval and kidney marks, sort of scratchier um, appearance in terms of the ground mass. Um, clouded drabs, which are a bit larger, um, greyish, pinkish colorations, longer winged as well. Twin spotted quaker, which is not an orthosia, but is very closely related, which has two characteristic black dots um, sort of down about here on the moth effectively. 
um, and then into April, rarer species like powder quaker, and if you happen to live, live near aspen, lead coloured drab could appear. If you haven't got a light trap, um, one thing you can do to see these species is if you can find some flowering sallows near you, they're highly attracted to sallows, and the adults like to nectar on them. If you've got a head torch and go out after dark on a calm, mild night, you might be rewarded by finding large numbers of uh, things like common quaker, heber character, and potentially scarcer species as well. So that's the orthoceas. Uh, put them over there so I don't lose them. I've already lost one moth in here as they've woken up coming out of the fridge. Tom mentioned he'd caught chestnuts earlier. Um, here's a couple of chestnuts that I caught last night. So you can't really see from this, but they're a much smaller moth, quite short winged, broad winged, um, uh, as the name suggests, a sort of chestnut coloration. So different to the um, orthoceas, these actually emerge in the autumn. Um, they overwinter um, and then they reappear um, uh, later or in the springtime. The chestnuts can appear right through winter, in fact, in, in good weather conditions. Uh, uh, it's a slightly better one there, yeah, it's slightly less worn, that one. Um, you can see these characteristic little black um, inner edges of the, um, of the kidney mark there. So those are chestnuts. Um, Tom graced us with an absolutely awful joke there about satellites, unforgivable stuff. Um, fortunately, I do have a satellite, which is considerably better than the joke. Let me just get this lid open. So here is a satellite. This is a larger moth than the other ones we've seen. Um, quite long winged. Again, this overwinters in the adult stage. So emerges in the autumn, hibernates through the winter and then reappears in spring. Um, comes in two colour forms. So it's got, oops, sorry, I didn't mean to touch that. I meant to touch the mouse and get that back there again. Right. So the, um, the kidney mark's quite small um, and it comes in two sort of distinct colourations. Orange is in this one um, and they also come in white. And it's called a satellite because it's got um, two dots uh, around the, uh, the kidney mark. Now this is a bit worn, so you can only see one of the dots, one on that side, one on that side. There's actually two normally there. And it's called a satellite because you've got two dots satelliting the larger kidney mark. And so that is satellite. And then the final species I caught last night is early grey, um, which those have just emerged um, this spring. My favourite of the five species I caught last night, definitely. Um, there we have an early grey. Uh, so they're sort of greyish overall with blackish markings. Um, they've got a, a grey kidney mark, grey oval mark, and then the second oval mark in here, which is also grey. Sometimes the three marks all merge together. They're pretty distinctive. There's not much you can confuse them for at this time of year. Um, sometimes when they're fresh, they've got a lovely pinkish coloration, pinkish tinge. And none of the three I caught last night really have it, unfortunately, although they are in, in, in um, very good condition. Um, I don't think I can show the other ones very easily um, because of where they decided to sit in the pot. Let's see if I can get that one in. There we go, that's one of the others. Um, lovely caterpillars, very furry thoraxes and faces and, and, and four legs there. Um, so they're honeysuckle feeders. Um, they're quite common in my garden, but I know that um, other people don't see them so frequently. Uh, but if you've got honeysuckle nearby, it's a species that you could um, easily record at this time of year. So that's adult moss. I also went out and collected some leaf mines um, yesterday and this morning from just around the town. So I've got three leaf mines to show you. I'm conscious of still running over a wee bit, but I'll go as quickly as I can with them and share them with you. So the first one I'm going to show you is called uh, Phylonerycta leucographella. Um, and I've actually, what have I done? Oh, here it is. I thought I'd lost one of them. Right, so this is what we'll call um, a blister leaf mine. Um, so the adult moth has laid um, its egg on the upper surface of the leaf. In this case, it's a pyracantha from the garden. Um, the caterpillar um, then starts feeding and produces this sort of film that it, it lives behind. Um, and eventually, essentially, called a blister mine because it looks a bit like a blister. Um, 
there's the caterpillar itself, head in there. Um, and the dark material is the frass, um, the waste material that it's producing from its rear end whilst it's feeding. Um, so what will happen as this uh, caterpillar develops and the mine develops, the, um, the, the mine will bend the leaf inwards, um, upwards into a, into a V shape effectively. So Fulnerix lithographella, um, we have two generations of them in the UK. Um, primarily, uh, the best place to find them is on cultivated pyracantha in gardens and, and, um, and towns. Um, it also feeds on things like apple trees, hawthorn, uh, sorbus trees, things like rowans, and ketoniasters as well. Um, it's uh, not native to the UK. It first appeared in 1989, um, and it's found it very much to its liking here, and it's spread rapidly throughout the UK. Um, I planted a, a pyracantha in our garden um, about 12 months ago, and um, when I, this morning when I went out to look, there's probably at least 100 leaf mines on it already. Um, so they find their, their food plant very rapidly. So the next one I'm going to show you is called Femoria septembrella. Um, now this was for a while known as Ectodemia septembrella, but um, the, the name has changed a couple of times now. It's back to Femoria septembrella. Um, it, this feeds normally on uh, St John's wort, um, but it's also quite happy feeding on cultivated hypericum. Um, and if you can find some of the um, evergreen species of cultivated hypericum, um, then you can look for this leaf mine uh, now, even though um, feeding has finished um, back uh, in before, well, before Christmas, effectively, before the end of the year. So this is a different kind of mine. It's a gallery mine. You can see these um, sinuous tracks that it's made. Um, and again, filled with uh, frass. Um, and then ultimately it ends up in a blotch. This is uh, the end of the mine here, the blotch from which the lava exits. Um, it lays the adult moth lays the egg on the underside. And I think I actually found the egg earlier. So let's see if I can find it again. I think that is the egg up there. Um, but I haven't, <clears throat> excuse me, I haven't actually had time to really look at it in detail, but I think that's probably the egg there. Um, they have two generations again every year, sometimes a third generation, particularly in the south. And the final one I'm going to show you is Phanerichta lantanella. And this is quite um, a local speciality. Um, so again, this is a blister mine. Um, but instead of on the top of the leaf, like Phanerichta lycographella, it's on the underside of the leaf. Um, I'll show you the top side as well. So you can see what the top side looks like. There's not much to see. Um, the leaf sort of is slightly folded um, and you can see where there's been some larval feeding um, because it's just, the leaf has gone translucent. I'll turn it back over on the underside. Um, so the larva is feeding underneath this blister. Um, the, the, as the larva feeds, look for, the longer the leaf will become more uh, intensely folded. Um, and you can see there's got these longitudinal creases in the mine as well. So in the UK, Phenolorecta lantanella in wild, uh, in the wild, but um, in, in natural habitats feeds primarily on wayfaring tree, um, but it's increasingly now found on cultivated bush Viburnum tinus, which many of you will recognize if you don't know the name. It's an evergreen, large bush, glossy uh, dark green leaves, um, clusters of white flowers right through the winter. Um, it's been spreading northwards through England um, and reached Lancashire a couple of years ago. Um, but I found it in Scotland two years ago. It's the first place, first time it was found in Scotland. Um, it's still the only place that is known in Scotland in my village of Burnt Island here, the town of Burnt Island. Um, it seems to be doing well. I'm starting to find it on different bushes around the town now uh, from the uh, original uh, discovery site. It probably hasn't arrived in the town um, under its own steam. It hasn't suddenly flown all the way up from southern England. It most likely someone bought a Viburnum tinus in a garden centre that had leaf mines on it, planted it in their garden. The um, adults uh, emerged and the population has managed to, sus to sustain. It's probably not been looked for that much in Scotland, so it's well worth it if you find some of the food plant, having a little check and see. Um, you've seen what the leaf mine looks like. Um, in the earlier stages, it's not that obvious when you look at the upper side, but the older mines are a little bit more easy to spot. There's an older mine, and that's, this is one that's finished feeding. You can see 
how extensive the, the damage to the upper side of the leaf is. Uh, I'll push that down so it's in focus. There you go. You can see all the feeding and damage to the leaf. And if I turn it over, um, you can see on the underside, you can see the creases. So you know that it was a Phelanorictus species and not something else that was feeding on the leaf. And there is the uh, exit hole of either the um, adult moth or as Douglas was referring to earlier, a parasitoid wasp that may have taken over um, and uh, killed the larva. Um, so both this species and Phenolurcta leucographella will be really easy to rear if you ever want to see the adults. If you find the mines, just pop them in one of these little plastic containers I've been using, um, keep it inside. Um, two, three, four weeks later, keep an eye on it every day, you should be rewarded um, with either an adult parasitic, parasitic wasp or um, a beautiful little uh, mint condition finally ready to moth. Um, and that's everything from, from Burnt Island today. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much uh, to my two moth correspondents out in the field today. That was uh, getting very professional there, Nigel. Um, I'm very sorry that the moths have to go now. There's lots of people enjoying that in the chat, um, but we need to move on to our next speaker, Nick Morgan, who is an extremely active volunteer in East Lothian. Now, I know that the, about the grayling project in East Lothian, but I'm really interested to find out what else is going on there. So thank you for speaking today, Nick, and over to you when you're ready. So hopefully everybody can see that. Um, yep, yep. That's good. Um, I, I, I was recording butterflies, as I say, in the early 2000s, but when the um, new book, The State of Butterflies of Britain and Ireland, came out in 2005, I was very disappointed not to see the record of a clouded yellow that I'd seen in 2000, or a grayling I'd actually seen in 2001, or indeed a comma that was in my garden in 2003. And it seemed that all my records weren't actually getting to butterfly conservation. Um, so I decided to um, take matters into my own hands and try and gather together all the records from the countryside rangers. Um, and at that point, I discovered that all our records, which we beautifully written into our notebooks, um, the notebooks were then thrown away after a couple of years. So the records all just got lost, sadly. Um, so now we have a shared server where we're able to put all our records. And at the end of the year, I, I gather them all off there and send them in to butterfly conservation. Um, we're also very lucky to have a number of volunteers who work with us, and um, I cajole anybody who shows the slightest interest in butterflies into sending me their records. Um, now, the last 10 or 15 years has actually been a fantastic time to have been doing this. It's been a very exciting period in East Lothian, seeing quite a number of new species, or species arriving in Scotland. I can't say they're new species, because many of them are actually returning. Many of them used to be in southeast Scotland in um, you know, the, the early 1800s, but uh, then disappeared as, as the weather changed. Uh, and over the last six or seven years, we've had a fairly consistent number of people handing in records, um, which has allowed me to do a little bit of um, unofficial analysis on this. I um, had up the, the weekly number of each species and put them on a spreadsheet. And I don't expect you can probably see that in very much detail, but it allows me to compare year on year whether it's been an early season or a long season or a late season. And much of this very much correlates with the weather that we've been having. Um, I fear a little bit for next year when I think of the wet weather we've had this winter and the amount of flooding we've had in some areas, which I'm sure will impact on species later on in the year when we come to look for the adults. Um, now we all recognize the value of transects and in East Lothian we have nine different transects, um, but I quite like the idea of having ad hoc records. Um, I think that helps fill in the gaps. Most of our transects are along the coast um, where there's areas that the, the countryside rangers manage. Uh, we have a couple of transects inland, but I think the ad hoc records um, show up a little bit better how species are, are moving across the county or arriving in the county. Um, there's another thing I like to do is just put little graphs together. Um, with a darker line there showing the, the average um, of the number of each species we've seen over the last seven years. And the red line um, is, is the most recent year. Uh, 2020 is maybe not the best of years to be, to be highlighting that on because of uh, various difficulties we had. 
Um, obviously, the transit records all go off to UK BMS. We put them in on the website and I pass on all the ad hoc records to Simon Metcalf. Um, but this is all pretty much unofficial analysis I do of, of the records from about probably 20 people uh, normally that are sent in to me. Um, as I say, 2020 was a really difficult year. Um, the lockdown prevented people visiting many of the sort of favourite butterfly spots or walking the transects. Um, and in fact, last year, um, we only had one transect walked um, continuously. Uh, two of them were walked from July um, and the other um, six were, were just abandoned, sadly. Um, as I said earlier, we're very... You. Sorry, there's, Anthony. Uh, there's, there's a little box on your screen. Would you be able to click hide so that we can see the titles of your graphs? Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> so, right. Excellent. Thank you very much. Like very sorry. Um, with all the, these are the volunteers who work for the countryside ranger service, there's over 200 of them who were unable to do all the, the normal team tasks and group events. Um, so to try and keep them occupied and to, to help with what we were doing, we asked if any of them would like to record the butterflies that they were seeing in their gardens or while they were taking their daily exercise during lockdown. Um, so we ended up with about an extra 30 people submitting records last year, which is great. Um, it, we didn't get as many records as we maybe normally would, but we got considerably more that we would, than we would have done otherwise. Um, and as I say, it's been a, a really exciting period. I have really enjoyed watching um, speckled woods expand um, across East Lothian. Um, hopefully these slides are coming through as, as I'm talking, but the very first record of speckled wood is right on the East Coast of my uh, cursor. Um, right in the corner of East Lothian, come up from Berwickshire and arrived in Dunglass. And interesting, another one was seen up in Dunbar um, that same year. I'll just quickly go through the next year. The following year, there's only one scene. They seem to be uh, continuing up the coast in 2011, um, jumped across to Abilady in 2012. 2013, they really were expanding, using the River Tyne by the looks of things to expand inland. 2014 was a great year for them and so it continues until oops 2017 is the last year i bothered doing maps because i think they they more or less covered all of east lothian by that time um but uh fantastic to them expanding in that way um and wall browns is interesting what, um peter was saying earlier about wall browns not doing very well in southern england they're doing fantastically well up in in scotland um and this is another example of species that's come in along the east coast. Uh, the the Lammermuir Hills are presumably quite a barrier to any butterflies trying to get in. Uh, obviously, the coast has more milder weather, um, so it's it's maybe more attractive for them to come in that way. But they do tend to sneak around the eastern side of the Lammermuir Hills, um, and then from there continue along the coast or go in along the River Tyne Valley. Um, and then start to spread inland a little bit. Um, in 2014, we had our first um, large skipper arrive again at Dunglass, and I thought this is great. We'll watch them continuing along the coast, following the the wall browns and the speckled woods. But they sneaked along the foothills of the the Lammermuirs, um, went around towards Gifford. Um, so th those are sort of areas that are still being recorded. Um, and I think there was actually one seen at Torness, which is just a, a little bit further up the coast here. But um, for some reason, they've taken a, a slightly different route. Maybe it depends on the habitat that's available for them. Um, and the other species was um, the small skipper, which bizarrely just suddenly arrived at Abilady near, or between Abilady and Gullen in 2011. Um, we didn't really quite know how it got there. Um, a couple of years later, we picked up records from all of these areas, and it looked really as if they'd been coming in over Sutra. If you drive up the A68 and climb up over Sutra, uh, you pass Lynn Dean, and we suspect they probably came in that way and skirted around the west side of the Lammermuir Hills. But um, they, they've now spread along the coast, um, almost in the opposite direction, and are, are pretty widespread across East Lothian now. Um, quickly jumping to just a, a couple of years ago, the holly blue is, is our latest excitement in East Lothian. Um, rather bizarrely, for the last uh, 10 years or so, we've had about one record of a holly blue each year. 
I think there's one year we had two records. And in 2011, there was a little colony at Abilady, um, which only lasted one year. Um, interestingly, that, that blue dot on the left-hand side of the screen in the West, that's New Hills, um, Brunstein area, where we were aware that there was a little colony in that area. But looking through Butterfly Conservation's records and Twix records, I've only come across one or two records. So we were aware of them, but nobody was unfortunately recording them or, or sending those records in which I suppose just shows the value of, of making sure the records do get sent to butterfly conservation. Um, but we had these all little scattered records, as I say, one a year, which made us suspect that somewhere around about Gullen or North Berwick, there was a big private walled garden with holly and ivy in it and a little colony of, of holly blues. And every so often one of them was flying east or west away from, from that garden. Uh, and then in 2019, there was great excitement uh, the, the darker blue dots on this map are the, the 2019 records, and the, the two um, to, to, to the left, to the west, um, are in Gullen in very popular areas, very public areas. One's out, right outside the public toilets, actually, uh, and another one uh, on a very well walked path. Um, so those appeared to be new colonies that had sprung up. I'm sure they would have been spotted otherwise. Uh, the other two are single records that were seen just to the east of that. So we were all delighted to think that well, probably there was a colony somewhere in Gullum and it's now jumped the wall and is, is somewhere a little bit more popular. Um, but then last year, we were astounded that we had records from all these areas. So that they, spread out quite a bit from Gullum, um, a lot in Abilady, some at the old site that we'd first recorded them in 2011, which we'd been monitoring relig religiously every year to, to try and find them. Um, so they certainly hadn't been there for the previous eight years. Um, we found them over by Long Nidri, um, down on the River Tyne, a few in East Linton as well. So it's quite a remarkable expansion. And I, I can only assume that they, they've all just spread out from, from those ones that we'd seen the year before in Gullen. Um, as I say, it's, it is interesting that a lot of these species are returning to East Lothian. It, it, does appear that it's the climate that's um, changing and allowing them to come in. Um, as Peter had mentioned, the, the wall brown, maybe the, the length of, of, of the summer months is, is just that little bit too long down in, in England and up in Scotland. It's just got to the right, uh, right level because they're, they're doing so well up here. Um, I just want to jump now really to the, to the grayling project because this is one that we've been um, looking at the, the species for a while. Uh, on this map here, you'll see Aiken Gaul is on the east side. There's a little kluch in the middle of the Lammermuir Hills where a very small colony of graylings appear to be. Um, there's actually a, a colony of Northern Brown Argus there that's been monitored. And the person who's monitoring them would just say, well, yeah, so a couple of graylings. Um, only, I think, three or four is the maximum count from that area. Um, Blindwells there, you'll see, is it's an old open cast site. Uh, it's, I think it's about, um, I'll just ch check my, my notes how, how big that is. Um, sorry, yeah, 390 acres at Blindwells. It was an open cast. It was opened in 1979, closed in 2000. It's been returned to grassland and is destined to become um, a big housing development, a big new town. Uh, initially, I think it'd be 1,600 houses, potentially up to 6,000 houses in, in that, all that area. And the colony of Graylings was first reported there in 2009 by somebody who said there was a strong colony, but they said that they'd been there for a few years, so we're not quite sure how long they'd been there. Uh, just over the road from Blindwells is Meadow Mill, uh, another industrial site. It's an old landscape thing. You've probably seen a, a strange looking pyramid if you drive along the A1. And Graylings were discovered there in 2011, we assume it was ones that had come from the Blindwells colony. And they're doing fantastically well there. There's a, maximum count of about 80 being seen there, but very, very vulnerable. Um, you know, a, a bin could go up on fire or it could be redeveloped or anything and that colony could be lost. Um, this is the railway siding at Blindwells where we um, had been finding them. And unfortunately, uh, this whole site has now, well, other than this little bit of the railway siding, it has all been bulldozed and leveled. It was amazing grassland, all sorts of species there. So it's sad to, to, to see the state it's got into. 
Um, historically, graylings were found at Adelaide, Timingham, St. Talon, right on the coast, North Bright Law and Train Law. And you, you wonder why they've disappeared, because these are areas that haven't really changed much as, as far as habitat is concerned. I think these records are from the late 1800s. Uh, and again, we, we wonder whether it's in response to changing climate or something that they've changed. So we're determined to try and save this colony at Blindwells. Um, if I go back to the, the previous map, you'll see Leaven Hall, the green dots. This is a site that is owned by East Lothian Council. It used to be the where the fly ash was um, dumped from Kenzie Power Station. So it used to belong to Scottish Power, it's slowly being handed over to the council. And there's an aerial photograph there, it's that green area all um, above the race course, um, just the east of the mouth of the, the River Esk in Musselburgh. Um, so luckily the council has, has control of this. And luckily we have um, a lot of volunteers who are very enthusiastic, one of whom, Abby Marland, really drove this project and was determined to try and save the, the Blindwells colony and see if we could relocate them to um, Leaving Hall. Um, I just jump to the next slide. This is a, an area of ground which is south facing. It's about 50 meters long by about 30 meters. And uh, as I said, Leaving Hall is, is mostly made up of pulverized furnish, furnace ash from the power station or the, the coal fired power station. It's been covered with a layer of topsoil and you'll see the topsoil in there is only less than a foot deep. Uh, we scraped off two areas of topsoil um, to reveal the fly ash underneath. And we received so much advice from so many people. Abby was, was contacting everybody left, right and centre. And it was we were told that crushed concrete would make a very good substrate to try and um, provide a, uh, an area for them to, to lay their eggs if we seeded it with um, sheep's fescue and red fescue. And it just so happened that um, I was sitting in my office one day and the manager of the parks department came past and was moaning that they just had a, a, a depot demolished and it was going to cost him thousands of pounds to have the crushed concrete removed and dumped. And I sort of rubbed my hands together and said, oh, do you want to, somewhere to put it? So we were very, very lucky to get, um, I think it's about 300 tons of crushed concrete free of charge. We were also very lucky at the time that we went to the East of Scotland um, AGM, the Butterfly Conservation East of Scotland AGM, where we heard that funding was available for small projects. So Abby immediately jumped up for the coffee break and um, grabbed the pithony, and we managed to secure some funding to get a contractor to spread the crushed concrete for us. So this was all delivered um, in 2008, in the summer of 2008. Um, you'll see that the, the concrete's been delivered there, and this is after it had all been um, put in place. The eastern section there, we've tried to recreate the, but the railway sidings by having long rows of the crushed concrete. On this western area, we've um, put in piles of concrete, random piles of concrete. And as I say, these two areas were seeded with sheep's fescue and red fescue. The bunding at the bottom, the soil that was removed was bunded at the bottom and at the top of each of these areas. So there's a dry meadow mix of, of flowers, wildflowers went in at the bottom. Uh, the area in the middle there was um, cut very, very short and all the, the um, planings, the, the risings were, were raked off, uh, were seeded with yellow rattle to try and create a, a wildflower area in there. Um, so our next problem really was how to try and get the butterflies there. Um, we had a great plan, this is Abby's idea, was to um, go and locate caterpillars. As Peter says, caterpillars are really easy to find at night, so you go and look at them with a torch. Um, unfortunately, this didn't seem to be the case. We only managed to find one caterpillar. Um, the intention had been to mark where the caterpillars were in, in which tussock of grass, pick up the tussock of grass, put it into a, a, a willow basket and replant it on site. And that would have allowed this site here at Leadenhall to have vegetated over better. And the, the intention was in 2019, would simply remove those baskets containing a tussock and a caterpillar and install them here. So we, we failed miserably trying to find our caterpillars. So plan B was to try and find eggs. Um, and we, we went searching for eggs at Blindwells and 
I don't think we came across any eggs there at all. Um, we had pretty extensive search, um, and uh, yeah, no luck at all there. So we, we switched to plan C, which was to look for eggs at Meadow Mill on the, on the pyramid. Uh, now, this is quite a public place. That's the viewpoint there for the Battle of Preston Pans at the, at the top of the picture. And there's a biodiversity officer and countryside ranger flying in the grass looking for caterpillars. Um, we, we didn't do very well. We didn't get any caterpillars there. So we switched to try to find eggs there. Um, and in July of 2019, we managed to collect 36 eggs. And we took them along to Leaven Hall and placed them on, on suitable clumps of um, fescue, or we thought they would do well. But unfortunately, they all seem to perish, so there's no sign of any adults at all in 2020. So we then switched to, I think it's plan D, I'm losing track now of all these different plans, where the countryside ranger managed to catch um, 12 adult graylings in July of last year and took them along to Leaven Hall. Um, Put them there at night inside a cage. It was an open bottom cage and sealed it all around the base, thinking the next morning you'd get there before sunrise and just take the top off the cage and allow the, the grayling adults to do it. And he was amazed to find that there were none in the cage. They all had somehow managed to sneak out underneath, despite his best efforts to make it butterfly proof. Um, but when he went back at lunchtime, there were still five adult graylings flying there. That was um, 17th of July last year. Um, and that's as far as the project has got so far. We are now waiting with bated breath to see whether anything happens this summer. Um, with a bit of luck, those butter butterflies will have laid some eggs and we might well see some adults flying. Um, it's, it's all very much a learning process, though. It's never been done before. Um, we're, we're learning as we go along. And as you can see, we've, um, we've tried various different plans. I'm very grateful for all the advice we've received from likes of Peter and, and other people in butterfly conservation and also very grateful for all the work that very many volunteers have done including the junior rangers and all sorts of people who've um, helped to remove all the little bits of plastic and wire that were in the, the concrete and plant the seeds and, and reshape the, the concrete as well. Um, so yes let's hope we'll see some butterflies there this summer otherwise we're going to have to think what we can do for, for plan E and, and F and, and, and uh, after that. So uh, that's me. Thank you very much, Nick. Uh, your dedication is very inspiring. I'm so glad that you're an East Brancher. You're in my branch. Um, so our last few talks of the day are from BC staff members who want to highlight particular projects and opportunities for you to get involved with. First up is Patrick Cook, who many of you will know from his QGIS tutorials, uh, which have received absolutely glowing reviews. Today, though, Patrick is going to be talking all about monitoring mountain burnets. OK, uh, thanks for having me. I'm just going to start sharing my screen. Uh, so hopefully you can see that OK now. Yep, all good. OK, um, so today I'm going to talk to you about monitoring the mountain burnet, so one of our kind of montane species of moths. So I'm going to split the talk up into kind of three different sections. So the first bit will be about why we are actually monitoring moths and the kind of wider project around that. The second bit will be delving into the kind of ecology of this species, finding out some of the fascinating um, stuff it does within its life cycle. And the third bit will be about the kind of trials and tribulations of how you actually go about monitoring this kind of montane species. So just as a bit of background, we've got quite a push to increase the amount of moth species that we actually monitor. If any of you have a kind of copy of the moth atlas, you'll realize a lot of the kind of rarer species we don't have any trend data, so an understanding of how their population is faring in terms of abundance or distribution um, as well. So what we want to focus on is some of these rare species and developing ways to kind of monitor them by either counting eggs, caterpillars, or looking at adults, depending on the species. We currently have methods for about 19 species that have been set up. But these are mainly focused in Southeast England. So we've only got kind of two species so far that contribute from Scotland, which is the new forest burnet 
and the slender scotch bayonet. So we've got quite an ambitious target to get this up to about 40 species by 2025. And there's lots of opportunities for monitoring moths in Scotland. And we really need as much help from volunteers as possible to get out there, trial some of these methods. There really is something for everyone, the kind of eagle-eyed person that loves looking for kind of caterpillars, but also for the sun lovers who like getting out on a kind of sunny day um, counting adult moths. So last year, we began this project trying various different kind of species in Scotland. Um, so a few of these we've already done trials and have already started kind of monitoring. A few others are on our kind of wish list to start this year um, or to review and have a look at and so on. So moving on specifically to the mountain burnet, um, this is kind of wonderful montane species of moth that is incredibly rare at the UK level. It's only found in three 10 kilometer squares. They're all centered around the village of Braemar. So to give you a kind of idea of how rare this species is, each of these red arrows indicates one of the known colonies of mountain burnet. So you can fit in all the colonies in kind of one photograph. There are scattered records from elsewhere, so more historical records, um, but individuals haven't been seen there in recent years. So in the center right, this is Braemar itself. We've then got a series of mountain burnet colonies that are found on Invercordicite. And we then have two that are also found on NTS Mar Lodge Estate. The one on the kind of left-hand side of the screen was only just found this year. A really key colony is the one found on Marone, and I'll be talking about Marone a lot today. And this is the most accessible, easily accessed colony. So you can see that these are in quite remote locations. Um, there's lots of potential to find new colonies if you go out looking at the right time of year. In terms of what the species needs, it's very much associated with its caterpillar, caterpillar's food plant, which is crowberry. So crowberry looks like this. You'll find it in coastal localities, but it's particularly prevalent in the kind of uplands, and particularly when you get above sort of 500, 600 meters or so. They're very kind of distinctive because of the kind of waxy small leaves, but also these black berries. As the name suggests, mountain burner is found up in the kind of high hills. So the general breeding areas are between 600 to sort of 900 or 1,000 meters. So this image is from around 600 meters. So we've got lots of this kind of bright green crowberry growing in amongst rocky areas with lichens and heathers. As you go further up the hill, the habitat becomes a lot more sparser. So this is at the very kind of top end um, of one of the mountain burnet colonies. Um, in early March last year. And you can see the conditions that this species has to deal with uh, during the winter. So a lot of kind of snow. This is the coldest kind of region um, within the UK um, and very kind of prone to freezing up for long periods of time. This is another example of higher up the hill, so about 700, 800 meters. Very wind clipped habitat for this species, so very short stumpy heather, lots of lichens interspersed with crowberry. The really key thing about this image that I want to hi highlight to you though, that's important for mountain burner, if you do go out looking for adults, is that there's a small burn running down here. And this is one of the few places that you can actually get shelter up on these high hills. Very easy to spot mountain burnets, and the adults often congregate there, particularly in poor weather. So there's multiple ways to actually go and look for this species. Um, one of the kind of more time consuming ways is to go and look for the caterpillars. So just before the lockdown began last year, I was out on one of the kind of colonies looking in habitat like you've got on the left hand side in mid March. You can find the caterpillars basking on kind of open sunshine um, on these rocks and they're this wonderful black and yellow coloration. 
being up in the high hills, they have a very clever strategy in that they can overwinter more than once, um, which helps them deal with kind of some of the uncertain conditions that you might get in the spring or even in the flight period as an adult. The adults themselves then emerge in mid-June and are on the wing until mid-July. I'm a bit biased, but I think they're one of our most stunning species that we've got, and they're really kind of charismatic. They do have this kind of Dennis the Menace coloration to them, so they've got a black with red spots. And when they're fresh, like this individual on the left-hand side, they have this really wonderful sheen. We do have lots of other burnet species that look similar um, in Scotland, but this these kind of spe this species in particular can be differentiated based on habitat. Um, compared to the six spot burnet, it's much kind of more transparent in coloration and the configuration of the spots are different as well. When you look at the female, which is on the right hand side, they also have these really obvious kind of yellowy pale white shoulder pads. So they look a bit like a kind of American football player, I think. They also have these pale yellowish white legs and the yellow dusting along the veins. Ironically, for a species that occupies the mountains, they only fly in sunny conditions, which doesn't happen very often. So this poses a challenge for monitoring. So how do we go about monitoring a species that's up on the high tops and only flies during certain specific conditions? So we decided last year to give this a trial. And there's two main methods that we can use to monitor this species um, that have been widely used to monitor butterflies. So the first is a transect and the second is a timed count. So we trialed both of these methods counting adult moths. So the first thing we did was set up a transect on Marone. As I mentioned, this is the most accessible hill and you can very quickly uh, in about 30 minutes get to the start of the transect location. Now this is really good going uh, for a species that is in quite remote locations. So the transect by and large walks up the main path um, but does deviate from various areas uh, just to capture where the colony is. So sector four is where the colony is in particular abundance. The transect is walked three or four times throughout the flight period, and that allows us to capture two pieces of information. The first is when the peak of that population occurs, and the second is um, how strong that peak is, so how large that peak is as well. If we do this over a number of years, so when we start to get towards 10 years, we can start to see if the population is declining, increasing, and how it fluctuates over time as well. So with the help of Helen Rowe, who's the local vice county recorder, um, we went and walked this transect three or four times during the flight season. Unfortunately, due to the COVID restrictions, we were a little bit late um, getting out. So we didn't get out until kind of 25th of June was the first date that we could get out. And it seemed like the population was probably already peaking. It was occurring in really good numbers. It was a wonderful kind of 21 degree uh, sunny day. So ideally this year, we're gonna get out a little bit earlier, um, but that was quite a good sort of learning experience. Predictably, uh, the weather then deteriorated, so we'd had quite a stable sunny spell, and that meant the numbers of moths uh, really did decline, um, but probably also because they were starting to go over their peak numbers as well. This did highlight that really we only need to be doing counts um, in kind of really good conditions, and that we do need folks to be able to help us with this so that we can make the most of those few sunny days. We did learn also that when the weather is kind of poorer, they do sit on the vegetation, that it's harder to count them and that your counts aren't as reliable. So that's what we've done at Marone in terms of walking the transit. We're aiming to repeat that again this year. There are, however, a number of other sites that we also wanted to visit. One, to trial the timed count method, but two, to find out exactly where these colonies are. 
A lot of them hadn't been visited for a number of years. So Pete Moore had done a great survey in 2009. And we just needed to update that and find out where they were for setting up monitoring. So a timed count is different from a transit in that you, again, sort of walk a route, but you just do it as a one-off. You can then adjust the count you get to the peak that occurs for the Maroon transit. So it's a kind of ad hoc way of gathering more data across lots of sites in a reduced way. So we were affected again, sort of by the weather, um, but also by the early kind of population peak. But we really did learn which sites were most accessible, which ones we could reliably get to each year. So some of these counts on the right, we found that the kind of Khan Lear and also Khan Al-Drakaid were very kind of accessible in comparison to a few of the other sites. Um, but the counts were quite late on um, in the season. This again highlighted exactly what conditions this species flies in. Um, and it's quite a Goldilocks sort of species being very fussy uh, when it does fly. Interestingly, the site on the very left-hand side of the graph called Kalaroch, this is a slightly different habitat type. So it's on the edge of Blanket Bog where Crowbury goes in profusion. And I actually got a really good count from this, which was undertaken by Ian Hill of Invercald Estate. Now, the reason for this, that I think, is that because the habitat's slightly different, the moth will actually sit on sphagnum mosses where it's much more obvious than it is on the kind of sites on the right hand side, where it will just sit interspersed within the heather and it's very difficult to spot. So there's little intricacies um, within different sites that we found whilst monitoring um, as well. So just to sort of summarize about the monitoring, we've learned a lot about what conditions the species flies in, exactly where it is. So coming up this year, we're hopefully we'll be able to get out a bit earlier on in the season. I just want to double check that all these methods work well. I uh, want to do timed count specifically at three sites across Mar Lodge and Invercald Estate. The key thing I really realized during the kind of trials this year is that we do need a small army of volunteers to help us to really get out on those sunny days and make the most of those two or three good days during the season. Uh, to try and get some good data. Because of where the species is, there will be certain years where if the weather's really poor, we might have to accept that we don't get that data. But hopefully over the coming years, we can start to understand that. One other thing, which is probably a bit experimental, but it's well worth a try, is we're going to test some counts of caterpillars as an alternative to the adults to see if this is a viable way of also monitoring the species and being a bit we less weather dependent. So just my final slide, I just wanted to particularly say thank you to Helen Rowe and Ian Hill. They're absolutely wonderful getting out in all sorts of conditions to test this um, monitoring method and gathered a lot of data in the process, but also to Mar Lodge Estate uh, for just being really accommodating uh, during the kind of difficulties of COVID this year. If you have any questions about kind of the moth monitoring project um, as a whole, or you'd like to take part, um, you've got any suggestions, etc., please do ping me an email um, on this on this address. And that's me. So that's all I was going to say. So I'll move on to a nice picture of Mountain Burnet uh, just to end there. Thanks very much, Patrick. That was very informative and lots of people commenting on how difficult it must be to meet the weather criteria. So yeah, definitely important that we get that army of volunteers for you. Mm -hmm. Please get in touch with Patrick if you'd like to be involved. Um, there are a few questions actually about the QGIS tutorials, I think because I mentioned it in the intro. Mm -hmm. I just wondered if you wanted to say anything about that. Are there recordings available for people? So we have a, a Yammer forum group, which is set up. So I can send folks a link to that group and they can then access all the recordings and training materials through that. In terms of the next training sessions, they'll probably be next autumn and winter or on a, another set of workshops for folks. Oh, great. That's great news. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you very much, Patrick. 
So our next speaker uh, will be familiar to many of you, since I'm pretty sure a good percentage of the audience today will have been inspired to get involved with BC through one of his engaging workshops. He's also the man behind the scenes today making this uh, try to run as smoothly as possible. So thank you very much, Anthony. <laughs> Over to you. Uh, and yeah, so I'm hoping people will volunteer with us as well this year by taking on a transect if you don't already have one. Uh, so with the reason we record butterflies is because we can make really useful reports like this. This is the State of UK Butterflies 2015, which used um, over two and a half thousand weekly transects, uh, records from over two and a half thousand weekly transects, as well as looking at wider countryside butterfly survey locations and 11 million other records. And it really tells us how butterflies are doing and it's our best way of understanding the populations. And this is really the best way of conserving them. Um, and you might find people sometimes saying, you know, statements such as this, you don't see many pearl border fertilities here anymore. Um, and who wouldn't love to see one? They're a really beautiful butterfly. But that doesn't make much sense when we come to the data. And the data is really what gives us um, the, the evidence to go on when we want to conserve species like this. So here is the data for pearl border fertilities. Um, so basically what you're looking at here is uh, are the locations where they're found are the colored circles, but all the, the blue circles show places where they're not found anymore. And that's actual evidence to show that species like this are declining. As well as that then, by using all of this data, we can look at their numbers and the downward, there's a trend since 1976, um, both the abundance and the distribution of the species is going down. And we can do this for almost all butterfly species if we have enough data for them. Um, and it also really helps us to know which ones we can be, should be concerned about. Uh, if you look at the map for the grayling, all the light orange dots show sites where it was found in 2010 to 2014. And you can see that it's really spreading through the UK. Um, and other species are doing this as well, as Nick showed us earlier in East Lothian. So we know which ones maybe we shouldn't be so concerned about and other ones which we need to focus our energies upon. As well as that, though, we can also study things like climate change and we can predict how future climate change will affect species. And that might then affect how we um, do conservation work in the countryside because um, we might want to connect uh, up some more areas so that these species can move through the countryside and respond to climate change. As well as that, though, um, it's all good well getting data for butterfly conservation, but for ourselves, it's really good for our mental and physical health. And it just gives you a really good appreciation of the wildlife around us. So just a quick summary of the different types of recording and monitoring. When we get records and we send them to people like Nick or to our local uh, recorders, they're what we call casual records. But then we also have monitoring, and this includes the UK BMS, the Butterfly Monitoring Scheme, and the Wider Countryside Butterfly Survey. And together, we call these transects. So if you look at transects, again, coming back to the Pearl Board of Tillery, gives us the best information on populations over time. It allows us to track the local and um, national uh, picture of different species. So for example, you'll see that Pearl Board of Tilleries are doing very poorly down south in England, but they're not doing so badly up here in Scotland. So there's perhaps something different going on between different countries that then we can factor into our work. And this data is mostly collected by volunteers like yourselves, contributing more than 80,000 efforts of effort per year, days of effort per year. And so we'd love you to help if you can. So essentially what a UK butterfly monitoring scheme transit is, is a weekly butterfly count along a fixed route and during suitable weather. There are all species transects, which run from the 1st of April to the 30th of September every year. But there's also single species ones. And these are really important for understanding species like small blue and northern brown argus. And for some of those, you only have to walk the transect for about four or five weeks in order to gather all the data. Um, and for some of these species, we're also missing data almost entirely for Scotland. For example, last year in Scotland, only one small blue transect gave data. So um, we really need more transects for these some of these rarer species. Um, if you if you are taking part in an existing transect, you'll be giving a, given a map with clear directions on it with a start and finish point and a number of sections where you record the butterflies you see on each section. Um, and you also record environmental data like temperature and sunniness. Um, most of them, um, so sometimes you can do a transect all by yourself, but that's quite a commitment for some people. You might want to go away on holidays or have other commitments. So many transects now are walked by small groups of two to three people, meaning you only have to do it every two or three weeks. Um, and that's a really nice way to get to know your neighbours and get to know other people in the branch, but also to share the load. 
Um, and here's just a couple of examples from last year. We have a case study from Karen Woodlands in, uh, in Murrayshire. Um, and two of my volunteers, Rosemary and Bill, um, they attended uh, one of my workshops last year in 2020 during lockdown. Um, and they started to explore the local area around Aberlour, including a forestry plantation. And some of these can look really boring, but obviously they sell some potential in it. Now, when we were released from lockdown, they went out to record butterflies and they first surveyed on the 24th of June. And what did they find? They found the small, small pearl border fertility in their first week. Um, and it was just coming to the end of the flight period for that species, so they didn't see it in subsequent weeks. But then the following week, they saw a dingy skipper. This is one of the least recorded butterflies in all of Scotland and one that we have very few transects for. And they just happened to create a transect for it at a completely unknown site and discover it there. So, you know, beginner's luck, I think, for that one, but also dedication from them too. So over the rest of the year, they walked that transect every week, finding 14 species and recording over a thousand butterflies. Um, and that's not bad for a transect that missed half of the year because of lockdowns. So, um, you know, it's a great tribute to the, to the efforts put in by them, but also to show you that um, it's a great way to discover your local area. And they were beginners. They were complete beginners when they started. And here they are contributing a great deal to our work. And they might find Pearl Border Fertility next year, which is an even rarer species. Just another one as well then. So um, in Kalalo Nature Reserve in Fife, um, two of the volunteers attended one of my workshops last year as well. They got in touch with me to find out if there were any existing transects near Dalgadi Bay in Fife that needed new surveyors. So I had a look on the map. I found that there was one at Kalalo which hadn't been surveyed in 2014. And even then it was only sporadic. So they got together in 24th of June, again, when lockdown lifted, they made a rota to do it every other week each. Um, and they walked the transect every week until the end of September. And they also found small pearl border fertilities at this site, very high numbers of ringlets, including 117 in one day and 37 peacocks and so much more. So there were other, um, other fertilities they found there too, including the dark green fertility, they found comma and, and high numbers of small copper too, showing that we don't always have to be looking for the rarest species. Some of these more widespread species are definitely um, you know, a real joy to see. And um, in total, they found 13 species there. So I want everybody to get involved. Um, suitable for complete beginners and those with more experience. And I'm running workshops this month. Uh, don't worry if you don't have time to write these down now because I will be sending out an email next week to remind people of the dates. But these are the dates this month when I'll be running transect workshops through Zoom um, and each one lasts two hours between 10 o'clock and noon in the morning. Uh, you can register using that address, which is on your screen. But again, we will send it around next week so you can book your place through that. Um, and that will cover butterfly ID and transect walking. Um, if you can't attend but still want to take on a transect, you can email me at that address. You might already know how to identify butterflies and don't need to attend the workshop, but I can still match you up with the transect, which I'd love to do. So, um, or you can make up your own as well. So just get in touch with me and I can, I can arrange that. Um, and so some of our priorities, just to finish up, um, we want these, these are our priority species, which we definitely need more transects of. Last year, we only had a single transect recording small blue in Scotland. So Really, the small blue statistic for the whole of the UK now is represented by butterflies not found in Scotland for the for next year for the small blue. So we want to remedy that. Grayling, um, especially on the west coast, we have no transects for graylings on the west coast so of Scotland at all. So it's important that we get some set set up there. Um, Dingy skipper around the Murray coast, Ayrshire, Dumfries and Galloway, and the Northern Brown Argus in, in those places, including Perthshire, Deeside, Borders, and Solway. And for most of these species, their flight period is about four or five weeks, so it's not a long-term commitment. Um, these are the maps just basically showing um, all of the transects we had in Scotland. Over the past two years, we've had 144 sites walked, but there are some huge white holes. Um, there are lots in the urban areas in the central belt, but we've got these huge areas with no transects. So really, we would, if you're living in one of those, get in touch and we can help you make up a transect. Um, and even if it's only for a peacock, what's wrong with a peacock? They're really stunning, beautiful butterflies. And hopefully there'll be many of those on your transects this year. So uh, thanks for listening. Um, I'm not sure if we have time for questions, but um, Epiphany, I'll hand over to you. Thanks, Anthony. Uh, it's a really good summary of all the different record types and also a good point made about getting out to look for butterflies being good for our mental health during these very strange times. So finally, uh, he's back again and he needs no introduction. Tom Prescott is here to round up all of our activities and what you can do to help. Hi, everybody. C can you hear me? I can hear you and I can see you. Brilliant. 
Okay, well, uh, I've come in from the cold. I'm um, back in my uh, very dark office. I'm about to share my screen. Hopefully you can all see that. So my task uh, for the next 20 minutes is to enthuse you all so that you all get out there and help us with some of our conservation activities. Obviously, um, last year, we were a bit curtailed with um, COVID. So some of the things that uh, I'm gonna mention now were things that we hoped to do last year that didn't happen. Um, some of them are new. Um, there's activities probably more or less throughout the whole country. Um, so there's no excuse. So if you aren't enthused at the end of this and you, you're not prepared to get involved, then I've obviously not done my job. Um, I'll mention a number of names. So there's lots of people you can contact to find out more information. But I think the easiest thing is for you all just to contact our generic Scottish email address, which I'll give uh, at the end of my talk. So uh, let's start. Bog Squad. Epiphany already mentioned a little bit about Bog Squad. Um, we run a number of practical work parties, primarily damming bogs and clearing scrub um, to wet, re wet a lot of these um, peat bogs, primarily for large heath, but also for a whole host of other biodiversity. So that these are a, a very happy gang of Bog Squad volunteers. Now, uh, Epiphany mentioned that we heard just last week that we have funding for next year through Nature Scott uh, to run our sort of um, priority species and advisory work. We are on tenterhooks uh, waiting for, for them to let us know whether we've got funding for Peatland Action. We're very confident that Peatland Action will carry on. We've got a bid ready to go. And if we get the funding, then what we plan to do is to run 20 uh, of these workshops or work parties, um, primarily in the, uh, in the central belt, uh, possibly even out on Isla. So Polly Philpot is our current uh, Bog Squad project officer. So uh, you will hear more from Polly about that later. But another aspect of uh, Peatland Action of our Bog Squad uh, project is we're very, very keen to try and find out more about where large heath is. So these are some of the bogs where large heath has been recorded. The yellow dots are where we have records since 2000. But the red dots, we've got no records of large heath from these sites since before 2000. So that's over 20 years ago. Now, it could be that nobody's visited. Um, some of these are very small sites. Um, so please get in touch. We'd be really, really keen for you, for people to get out there, particularly to the red dots there, the priority areas or the priority sites, but also to some of the, the yellow dots. So we'll, with the Bog Squad funding, we plan to pr promote this large heath survey and uh, encourage you to get out there. So it's a butterfly that's on the wing sort of June, early July. Epiphany has also mentioned Species on the Edge. This is a multi-NGO project. There, there's eight uh, conservation charities. You can see them all there. It's Species on the Edge because it's to do with coastal species. Um, that are threatened and you'll see that the species that we're working on are northern brown argus, small blue, marsh fritillary and uh, the burnets, so that our rarer burnets that are on the coast, so slender scotch burnet and transparent burnet and also new forest burnet. So there's lots of opportunities to get involved with species on the edge and David Hill is our project officer for species on the edge. We're currently in the development year. So we are catching plans as to what to do and where to go. These are our priority areas. The plan is if we get the funding for the rollout of the big project, it's a four year project. And if we keep to task and the funding goes in, then we are hopeful that the project will start in April uh, next year. But in the development year, we need to know more about where some of these butterflies are in these areas and also the condition of some of the sites. So you can see the colour coded area that's small blue. We want to know more about it at the Caithness sites, some of the Angus sites and around the Murray Firth, 
for the Northern Brown Argus, it's in the Solway, and again in the Murray First, and for the Burnets and for Marsh Fritillary, it's in Argyle, on the mainland Argyle, or on the coast, and the, some of the Inner Hebridean Islands. So if you want to get involved, David's your man, um, baseline surveys and habitat monitoring. Also on the Northern Brown Argus, uh, our wonderful volunteers in the borders, primarily run by uh, Barry Prater, have done a fantastic site, a fantastic job of raising the profile of this wonderful, small, beautiful, threatened butterfly. Now the, the, you can see there that there's a hundred over 100, around 150 colonies of Northern Brown Argus in the, the borders. And since, since 2016, uh, Barry has been organising volunteers to get out to most of these. A lot of them are under threat. You can see there on the photo on the left how much scrub is invading on this particular site. There's bracken coming in. A lot of these sites are under threat from tree planting. So we're really keen to get volunteers out to assess the suitability of these sites and whether the butterfly is still there. And a remarkable job that 135 of these sites have already been visited since 2016, but there's still 45 that we really need further visits. You can choose your own site. Uh, there's a, a map here just to show you, give you an example of some of the, uh, where some of the sites are. They're prioritized. So in this particular map, uh, uh, of uh, one kilometre square with a one in it, shows where rock rose, which is the sole food plant of the caterpillar of Northern Brown Argus. So this is a, a, a square where we know there's rock rose, and more importantly than that, we know that the rock rose is growing on a south facing slope. So the ones on this map, we suspect are more likely to have Northern Brown Argus. The twos are where we've only got, uh, we've, it's a similar scenario, but we've only got the record of the rock rows at a one kilometer resolution. Whereas at the ones, we've got the record of the rock rows at a hundred meter resolution. So it'd be a lot easier to find that rock rows in the one squares than it will be in the two squares. But we know from the botanists that uh, there is rock rows in that square. The threes and fours are a bit of a, a, a longer hope. Um, these are more, they're not south facing slopes, they're either flat or they're more northerly facing. So the threes have uh, rock rows at 100 metres resolution and the fours have them at one kilometre resolution. So there's a lot of squares there for you to, to have a go at. Uh, we can send you these maps. Um, and also we've done some very detailed mapping of some of the colonies. So the hatched area here shows uh, two particular colonies of, uh, of Northern Brown Argus. The blue squares are showing where the butterfly has been recorded and the yellow squares actually show you where rock rose has been recorded. So we can provide a lot more detailed information about some of these sites, ones that are already surveyed or ones that need surveying to show you some of the detail that really, really helps us in determining how well this, this uh, scarce butterfly is faring. Now, it's been such a success, this Northern Brown Argus project in the borders that um, others are wanting to do it elsewhere. So this is the Sidlaws between Perth and uh, Dundee. And the, the plan there is, is to try and find out how the butterfly is faring at these particular locations. Chris Stamp has very kindly um, taken, decided to take on the role of trying to coordinate this survey. So if you're in this area, um, please, and you want to get involved, then uh, please contact Chris. The wonderful thing about Northern Brown Argus is that it's a butterfly for quite a long time of the year. It's a butterfly, you can see it in June, July through to the beginning of August. Also, it's a species that you can look for the eggs. So the eggs are laid on the upper leaves of the rock rows. So although you have to get up close and personal, it's relatively easy to find the eggs. So you've got a long window to get out and, and uh, record this butterfly. So that's Northern Brown Argus in the Sidlaws. Patrick did a, has just given us a wonderful talk about mountain burnet trying to improve monitoring. Well, we're trying to do the same with marsh fritillary. And over the last couple of years, we've run a couple of training days. Uh, in 2020, we had some Zoom online training. And what was wonderful about that was that we had volunteers uh, from Butte, 
from Mull, from Isla and from Tyree, all in the same virtual room. And you can see there how we've really increased uh, the number of sites, um, in, certainly in 2018 and 19, and also in 2020, those red dots because of this. So we're keen to do more. It's, it's probably one of our highest priority butterflies. We really don't know how it's faring in Scotland. Um, the easiest way or the most reliable way to monitor this species is through the larval webs. So it's a single visit uh, in the autumn, end of August, first weeks of September, uh, walking a transect and trying to count the number of webs that you see on that transect. So a single visit will do it. So if you live in this area or you happen to come and visit this area in the autumn, then just let us know and I'm sure that we can find a site for you. Also, we are currently working with a student, Sam, uh, who's at the University of Glasgow. She is doing a PhD looking at combining really citizen science and remote sensing. So that her PhD is focusing on species rich grassland. And what she's wanting to do is to try and identify species rich grassland from aerial photos and from remote sensing. And what she's using is our transect data. So these transects that you can see are the locations on the map on the right are all sites that she's identified as having species rich grassland. Now she's only just started, but what she will be doing is that she'll be wanting volunteers, not just at these sites, but at other sites to join in with the citizen science and see whether her remote sensing maps when they're produced are actually accurate. So it's really good that with this project that we're using butterflies as a, uh, as a tool really to help identify this very, very important habitat. So that's another project that you can get involved with. Now on to the, to the moths. Um, for many years, we've tried to encourage people to get out and look for small dark yellow underwing, a small day flying moth that's associated with Bearbury. You can see there that it's, it's prime um, distribution is focused on the Cairngorms. What is a very alarming really for this particular species is that for most of our species, uh, because of the increase in recording effort, the fact that there's more people out there, we've got a far better system for um, receiving records. Also, we're far better at uh, promoting species like this. Normally, we find that having done that, the number of records actually increases. And this has been the case for species that we formerly thought were quite scarce, like Argent and Sable and narrow bordered bee hawk moth. But it really isn't the case for small dark yellow underwing. You can see there the blue dots, the blue circles is where it was recorded between 1970 and 1999. And there were 24 10 kilometer squares. Yet from 2000, it's only been recorded in 2000. So this is a species that we are concerned about. I ran a, a virtual workshop on uh, small dark yellow underwing and some of the other Bearbury dependent species. So if, if you want to get involved, um, I can send you my presentation. Um, we are keen to go out and look for the caterpillars. They've never been found in the wild before until two years ago when we went sampling with a, vac, with a um, bug vac areas where there were bearberry, and you can see the happy faces on the right and the caterpillar on the uh, below them, which as I say, we believe was the first one to be found in the wild. So we're keen to do this. We, when you do this uh, sampling, you get lots of uh, material. We put it in the washing up uh, bowls and therefore we need volunteers to quickly sample through them and sift through them to see what caterpillars are in there. And this used to be, or probably still is, the rarest of the bearberry dependent species, but we've now got a way of looking for it. This is Coleophora arctostaphylae. It's a case bearer. You can see the case that's hanging down a bit like a banana on the right-hand side of the, the right-hand photo. But in its very early stages, it mines the leaves. So it mines the leaves from the autumn uh, over the winter into the spring. And this has proved to be a very, very successful way of recording this species. So it's something you can do over the winter. Um, you can do it from now right to the end of May and then again in the autumn. And we found lots and lots of new sites and there's lots of other areas where we haven't looked for this species. So make a name for yourself, get up into the hills, 
Um, search the Bearbury on your hands and knees, and uh, I'm fairly confident that you can find uh, this formerly very, very rare species. And another scarce species, Carutis diana. Uh, we've done a little bit of work on it uh, over the last year or so. We were unable really to progress it last year. Uh, only occurs in Glen Affric, nowhere else. It makes these characteristic spinnings on the birch. So we've in, enhanced or increased the, um, its distribution, but still only found it within the Glen. Uh, two years ago, we ran a couple of workshops like this up the Glen. As I say, we were unable to do that this year, but or last year, hopefully we'll be allowed to get out and play and run something similar um, in 2021. But you can see here where we found this moth. The, the green polygons, the green areas are where we found spinnings in the past. Uh, red areas are where we've looked but not found them. And the intriguing thing is that we've found probably over 50 um, spinnings, yet we, we, it's very difficult to find the adults. We've only found the adults in two locations. And they don't really match up with where we found the spinnings. Also, although it's a wonderful glen, Glen Africa, and it's got lots of birch, so it's obviously suitable for this moth, surely this moth must be up some of the adjacent glens. Is it up Glen Strathfarra, for instance, which is just to the north? So we'd be really keen for people to look for this uh, moth, uh, particularly as in its spinnings, because that will identify the breeding habitat, but also as an adult. And where we found the adults, they've been nectaring on um, ragwort, and on creeping thistle, which again are two plants that, although are very attractive to lots of species to nectar on, you wouldn't really say they were characteristic plants of Glen, somewhere like Glen Afric. So there's a, a lot that we need to find out about this species. So if you want to go up into the wild glens um, in the central highlands, then there's a challenge for you. Similarly, Eaena argentina, an equally rare species. This one is only found in Glen tilt just to the northeast of Blair Athol. Two years ago we ran a workshop there. We, the, the Blair Athol estate were very, very helpful. We were able to drive 10, 11 miles up, up the glen to the site where the moth has been known and has been known for a number of years. Um, so we found that the moth was there in very good numbers. We had a student do a project there last year. But what we really need, need to do now is to revisit and to spread our efforts more thinly across the whole glen and really try and find out where this species is. Is it, is it really restricted to this very small area or does it occur further up and down the glen? So we'll be able to get access up there, vehicle access, we can all meet up hopefully and spread out, maybe run some moth traps, but uh, you know, look over about 10 or 12 miles of the glen. So please get involved in a wonderful, wonderful landscape. Just a wee plug for a couple of my workshops that are coming up. So I, like Anthony, I've gone over to Zoom. I've been focusing on the priority species. So on uh, this coming Thursday, repeated Saturday at 10 o'clock, I've got a workshop uh, for, they last about an hour on Scottish clearwings. So focusing on Welsh clearwing, which is the one on the left, but also large red belted clearwing. The following week, again on the Thursday morning and the Saturday morning, it's barred tooth striped, which is a species that uh, feeds as a caterpillar in Scotland only on ash. We're therefore concerned about it because of ash dieback. It occurs in the Great Glen and in Argyll, uh, possibly in, in Perthshire. It's not been seen there for a number of years and similarly so in Dumfries and Galloway. So, so please come along to them. Um, as I say, 10 o'clock, they just last an, an hour. Now let's get you out there and get your hands dirty. These is, this is just to highlight three work parties that we're hopeful with COVID uh, we will be able to run. So in the far north, this is at Logie Quarry, not far from Tain. Um, it is a site for small blue. We've got permission there from the local estate to go in and clear scrub. Similarly, in Glen Feshi, this is an old uh, quarry site in, in Shriok Forest. Uh, which is scrubbing up and the scrub needs to be removed to benefit uh, small blue and dingy skipper. And the third site is uh, close to Gala Shields. It's an old railway line where the farmer has given us permission to remove the scrub 
And in this case, it is to benefit Northern Brown Argus. So the other workshop work parties like this will, uh, you know, will arise during the course of the year, but uh, they're great fun events. It's really nice to be working outside with like-minded people. And often there's lots of tea and coffee and of course the added important ingredient of cake. Anthony mentioned his workshops. Uh, this is me giving them a plug as well. Uh, butterfly identification and monitoring uh, in the mornings on those particular dates. And finally, if, uh, if you want to know anything about our events, the best place to go is our website. If you just go onto the main BC website, there's a wee tab that says events. If you hit that tab, you'll see this particular page. And then it says search by branch. If you look on that particular tab, that you can search for all the Scottish events by putting Scotland in that box, and that will give you all the events. Um, so that is well worth doing. If you want to know anything about any of these events or anything else, then please just email our Scottish generic email address that you can see there. Um, and one of us will respond and answer your query. So I think that's it from me. Thank you very much for listening. And yes, if you're not inspired to get out and about uh, during the season and help with any of these projects or any of the others that come up, then uh, yeah, I've not done my job. So thank you. Thank you, Tom. Hopefully I will be able to get back out to some interesting sites this summer. But there's so much going on. Like you say, there's no excuse not to get involved. And I'd hugely recommend attending one of our Zoom ID workshops as they're really useful. And you're getting off lightly today because there aren't actually any questions, I don't think. So we've now come to the end of our spring gathering. I just want to say a huge thank you to all of our speakers and BC staff today. I know we're all spending basically our whole lives in Zoom meetings at the moment. So we're very grateful for you to giving up your Saturday uh, to speak to us. And thank you to everybody else for tuning in to listen. Apologies that we ran over a little bit, but I'm sure you'll agree that it was worth it. I don't know about you, but I always feel really enthused and inspired after our gatherings. Sometimes when things are a bit off, all you need is to hear about the valuable work going on by individuals and to hear somebody speaking really passionately about their subject. We've heard about fascinating life cycles, reminding us that there's always something to be on the lookout for. We've heard about the work of dedicated volunteers. We've also been given a stark reminder regarding the impact that urban infrastructure might be having on our moths. But I think most of all, the overwhelming message of you is that every one of you can be part of this drive to protect our butterflies and moths. Whether it's engaging with us online or in person, attending one of Tom's threatened species workshops or one of Anthony's urban ones, whether it's planting pollinator friendly things in your garden or joining Polly for some bog squad habitat restoration, not to mention the plethora of resources available from the comforts of your computer to help you brush up your ID skills in the meantime. Remember that there is light ahead and spring is just around the corner. So I wish you all a pleasant weekend and a very positive start to the butterfly and moth calendar. So thank you for joining us and stay safe and see you next time.